good morning and welcome to the second day of public witness hearings on tribal programs under the jurisdiction of the Interior Environment and Appropriations Subcommittee. Once again, the hopes of and the hopes of having a more in-depth focus on issues facing Indian Country, we have organized witnesses according to the following topics: healthcare, land, trust, natural resource management, including climate change, public safety and justice, education, tribal government, and human services. Yesterday, we heard from witnesses about the urgent need for health care and the important issues facing uh, and impacting land, trust, natural resources, and climate change. This morning, we'll begin with panels on public safety and justice issues and conclude with witnesses on educational issues. This afternoon, we'll welcome Native leaders to discuss tribal government and human service issues. I welcome today's distinguished elected tribal leaders and non-elected uh, tribal leaders, all who play an important role in educating others on Native issues uh, and challenges. The issues we'll be hearing about this morning once again are part of treaty and trust obligations that the United States owes to Native Americans. Although the subcommittee has been focusing on increasing funding for public safety and justice issues, we know how much more is needed to address the unique challenges facing Indian tribes, such as being in rural isolated areas, insufficient staffing and salary challenges, and inadequate buildings. This morning we'll learn more about uh, these needs. Unfortunately, when the situation is the very same when it comes to education. We have a responsibility to provide a quality education and safe buildings to all students. And this is not happening in Indian country. With dilapidated buildings, teacher recruitment and retention challenges, and I might add, roads that are so bad they cause delays, long bus rides and longer bus rides and damage equipment. These are just a few of the examples creating challenges to the um, education of Native American children. And similarly, tribal colleges have unique challenges compared to other colleges and universities. Yet these schools continue to operate and successfully graduate students, <coughs> Native and non-Native, despite the obstacles they face. So I'm eager to learn more about your priorities today along with the rest of the committee. We look forward to our discussions on these issues because I believe it will help us inform us as we begin to develop our 2021 appropriations bill. Mr. Joyce will be joining us shortly and um, out of respect uh, for the people who have testified, he wishes for us to start so we don't uh, start delaying people. And I thank Mr. Joyce for that courtesy to the committee and to all of you. So here's some logistics. I'll call each panel of witnesses to the table. We have our first panel of distinguished witnesses already here. Um, each witness will have five minutes to present testimony and we'll use a tracker to track the time. So when the light turns yellow, you have a minute left. And um, when the light blinks red, I will lightly tap the gavel and ask the witnesses to conclude their remarks so the witnesses can begin. And I do mean lightly, I was I maybe a little too light yesterday, so if you hear that, that's the light tap, tap, tap. <laughs> I don't want to swing it down hard and cut you off mid-sentence as you're closing. Um, each witness, your full, your full statement's in the book. We, all, we have access to it. We thank you for that, and I know sometimes you elaborate on other things important to, to your tribe in your region. We thank you for that information as well. So don't feel pressured to cover everything, and we're, you're going to be getting some questions for us too. I'd like to remind our guests in the hearing room that committee rules prohibit the use of cameras and audio equipment during the hearing by individuals without a House-issued press credential. So when this morning hearing concludes, we will adjourn and then, no, we will recess. We'll adjourn. We're going to adjourn? Yep. Okay. We'll we got in this whole thing about recess and, and adjourning yep. yesterday. Yep. Want to get it right. We're, We're all in agreement. We're going to adjourn. We're going to adjourn and reconvene at 1 p.m. for the hearing this afternoon. Uh, with that, I'm happy to uh, yield to Mr. Kilmer, who says he wants to get right into testimony, sure. so we will do that. Um, we uh, will not have any votes this morning, so that's why we won't be recessing. We'll go straight to adjournment when, when at, at 1 o'clock when we're done, so that is fabulous news for all of us. 
I would um, like, um, we'll start with uh, Mr. Rambler, to introduce yourself. We won't count that against your time. And then we'll start right into the inner, just after your introduction, start right into your testimony. We found we gained time and we didn't run as far behind rather than doing a double introduction with me doing one and then you doing one. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, great. Mr. Rambler, will you lead us off? Okay. My name is Terry Rambler. I'm the chairman of the San Carlos Apache Tribe located in southeast Arizona. We're about 16,900 strong, and uh, the, uh, we're located in Gila. We're located in Gila and Gra Graham and uh, Pinal counties, and our environment is very unique in that half of our area is a uh, desert environment, and the other half is a uh, is, uh, pine country, so we, we, it's very unique. Okay, good morning. My name is Terry Rambler, chairman of the San Carlos Apache Tribe, which is 16,900 tribal members strong. The current size of our reservation is 1.8 million acres. I appreciate this opportunity to testify. My verbal testimony focuses on the following. One, the dire need for BIA to replace Building 86, which housed our police department and tribal courts before BIA condemned it in 2009 without an adequate replacement. Two, the need to increase funding for BIA public safety and justice operations. Three, the need to support education for juvenile detainees. And four, the need to ensure that IHS can demolish its old hospital on our reservation without appropriations language preventing this. The BIA built Building 86 in the 1970s to house our police department and courts. The BIA owns Building 86 and had the responsibility to maintain it. In 2009, the BIA condemned it and tried to hand us the keys. BIA renovated a nearby federal building and moved its investigators there. However, BIA left our police department and courts in this condemned building. Six years later, BIA finally moved our police department and courts into a modular building with the promise to permanently replace the facility. The BIA modular is not functional. The electricity and AC go out consistently. The water and sewer doesn't work. The doors don't lock and the walls and floors are flimsy. Here is a picture of our police officers in front of the modular building. You can move closer to us so we can see that. Thank you for bringing that. I ask you to walk in their shoes. What would you do if you and your staff had to work in 120 degree heat with no air conditioning, no running water, disgusting portajons, and little workspace? What would you do if your constituents, including elderly and children, had to also deal with these conditions at the facility when they are already going through traumatic situations? We request an increase in funding for the replacement of public safety facilities in FY21 and continued direction to BIA to replace condemned non-corrections facilities, including Building 86. Our committed law enforcement personnel risk their lives daily Last year, the San Carlos Police Department handled almost 54,000 dispatch calls, resulting in 32,000 calls for service and 3,000 arrests. Police patrolled over 323,000 miles. Our police officers work 12-hour shifts and overtime regularly. They endure extreme situations made worse by the lack of an adequate facility. To give you a sense of the condition our officers face, here's a picture of our police officers blocking off a major road while working to contain a gang shooting which also involved drugs and a hostage situation. We request an increase in funding in FY21. The volume of law enforcement needs increases every year as we face countless rising costs. On our own, we provide classroom instruction for our most at-risk youth and have made much progress on the shoestring budget. Thank you for providing BIA with funding for juvenile detainee education. BIA has told us that it will only provide this funding to direct service tribes, not 638 tribes, like us who have worked to improve our self-governance on detention needs. We seek the committee's assistance so that we can access this funding. There's another picture there, an example of what can be done to turn young lives around. Here's a photo of a young man who earned his GED at the detention center. We are proud of how far he has come. IHS built a hospital on the reservation in 1962. Over time, this facility became antiquated and needed to be replaced. It took 30 years, but a replacement health care facility finally opened in 2015. Here's a picture of the old hospital. The old hospital is centrally located in the busy area and has sat vacant for over five years. 
It poses safety hazards, and we are worried about the potential for criminal activity there. IHS planned to demolish the old hospital this year. However, the final FY20 appropriations package contained a sentence that prevents IHS from proceeding with demolition projects that cost over $500,000. IHS reports that the demolition of the old hospital will cost more than that given the size of the compound, our remote location, and rising costs. We request the committee support for IHS's efforts to demolish the old hospital, and that language preventing IHS from doing this does not make its way into the final appropriations bill. In closing, my elders have instructed me to remind the committee that we are not here asking for welfare handouts. Instead, we are here asking the federal government to honor its obligations to my people under our Treaty of 1852 for the many things done to my people. And I thank you for your time. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim. Let me get that going. Okay, there we go. Uh, and, and I just read the instructions and I overlooked <laughs> it, so it's my fault. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Timothy Nevangelma. I and the chairman of the Hopi tribe. And uh, we're located in northeastern Arizona, and um, I'm glad to be here to offer testimony this morning. And uh, good morning, Chairwoman McCollum, uh, Congressman Kilmer. Uh, my name is Timothy Nevangyama, and I have the honor of serving as chairman of the Hopi tribe. My testimony will focus on the needs related to the Hopi Arsenic Mitigation Project, the Hopi Detention Center, and the Hopi Unified School District. We are pleased to report that the HAMP is now ranked as a priority. Pro um, first, the Hopi tribe requests the subcommittee provide funding for the completion of the Hopi Arsenic Mitigation Project, or HAMP. During my testimony before this subcommittee last year, I discussed the issue of arsenic contamination in the Hopi tribe's water supply. The water for eight of the tribe's villages is contaminated with high levels of naturally occurring arsenic levels that exceed the EPA's safe drinking water standards by as much as three times the allowable contaminants. This troubling situation led the tribe to create the HAMP, whose mission is to find a solution to the arsenic contamination. Since I appeared before the subcommittee last year, there have been some positive developments. First, the tribe greatly appreciates subcommittee staff, along with Indian Health Services representatives, visiting us to tour HAMP. We are pleased to report that HAMP is now ranked as a priority project by IHS and the EPA. This designation provides full funding for fiscal years 2020 and 2021 through Safe Drinking Water Act program allocations. However, those funds are contingent upon receiving their respective annual budget appropriations. In addition to HAMP, we are working with the BIA on the Hopi Regional Water System Expansion Project. This project would extend the HAMP water system to schools residences, and institutional facilities. The estimated project construction cost is approximately $7.5 million. The tribe is also working with the Bureau of Reclamation on a regional water master planning project. These critical water safety projects are not funded beyond the planning phase and are dependent on future, future congressional support. The Hopi tribe's second request may also be familiar to the subcommittee. That is to help ensure timely completion of the permanent Hopi Detention Center. In response to the abrupt condemnation and closure of the Hopi Detention Center in 2016, the BIA worked with the subcommittee to identify and ultimately approve $5 million for the construction of a permanent detention facility, quoting a July 2017 letter from the Interior Department to the subcommittee. Once initiated, project completion could be accomplished within seven to nine months. As of today, two and a half years after that letter, there is still no shovel in the ground. The BIA was supposed to install a prefabricated building because it was the quickest to deploy. However, without consulting the tribe, the BIA switched to a design build. Currently, an architect is designing a new detention center, but it is unclear when any actual construction will begin. To say that the tribe is frustrated is an understatement. Even yesterday, the BIA informed the tribe it was changing the size of the facility from 80 beds to 60 beds. This was a unilateral decision by the BIA without consultation. We cannot wrap our heads around the fact that this subcommittee approved the $5 million two and a half years ago, and we have no broken ground, only a broken promise. 
Finally, the Hopi tribe is asking for this subcommittee support as we work to unify our seven tribally controlled schools under a single school district. Our seven schools were originally operated by the BIE and the BIA. From 1991 to 2014, the Hopi tribe gradually took over management of these schools under the Tribally Controlled Schools Act. However, the schools remained individually operated by local school boards. With little communication between the schools, our students struggled to achieve academic success. In order to address this issue, the Tribal Council enacted a new Hopi Education Code in August 2019. The code creates a new unified Hopi school system that will improve collaboration, consistency, and educational services within our schools. As we transition to a new unified Hopi school system, we will need assistance for several components of this undertaking, including funding to manage the transition and construct the central administration office. We've already identified the site for the administration building and estimate total construction costs will be $2 million. Two, funding for new school construction. Four of our schools, including the nearly 100-year-old Hopi Day School, are in very poor condition. And finally, more flexibility. Under the Tribally Controlled Schools Act formula, once the tribe is under a unified school system, application of the current formula would reduce our administrative cost grant by 25%. This will result in the annual loss of over $1 million to Hopi schools. The Hopi tribe appreciates any support the subcommittee can lend to this positive transformation of our school system. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michelle Demert. I'm a citizen of Central Council Clinkett and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska, and I am the elected Chief Justice of our Supreme Court. I am also the Violence Against Women um, co chair for the National Congress of American Indians. Um, <coughs> So today I would like to speak to the public safety issues in Alaska, which suffers as a result of the complex jurisdictional structure, the vast geographic challenges, and public law 280 issues. In addition, I will be making a suggested amendment to an appropriation statutes from the 90s regarding legislating background checks. We desperately need this amendment for all of Indian country. The 2013 Indian Law and Order Commission issued the report, a roadmap for making Native Americans safer, and devoted a chapter to the unique issues in Alaska. The report found the absence of an effective state justice system has disproportionately harmed Alaska Native women who are continually targeted for all forms of violence. Alaska Native women are overrepresented in the domestic violence victim population by 250%. They comprise 19% of the state population, but are 47% of reported rape victims. The report further stated that the centralized law enforcement with the state puts women at risk. Why is the centralized law enforcement? Because of Public Law 280. In a September 2019 report, Alaska ranked first as a state with the highest homicide rate among female victims killed by male offenders. Three times the national rate and the victims murdered, 40% were Alaska Native or American Indians. These staggering statistics have to stop. There are many barriers that make it difficult for Clinkett and Haida to adequately protect our Alaska Native women residing in what are often remote villages. The crux of the problem is that Alaska is a mandatory PL-280 state, which in the 1950s required the state to assume criminal and civil jurisdiction in matters involving Indians, an unfunded mandate. The National Institute of Justice has observed the impact of PL-280. The act violates tribal sovereignty by giving states concurrent criminal jurisdiction. The act is often cited as a rationale for denying PL-280 tribes funding for law enforcement. Public Law 280's impact on crime is largely unknown. This is because crime in associated jurisdiction is often underreported or not reported at all. 40% of our communities in Alaska lack any law enforcement whatsoever. Legal scholars point out the issues. Although data is difficult to obtain from the BIA, we did determine that for fiscal year 1998, this is how long ago they've even looked at this issue, mandatory public law 280 tribes received less than 20% per capita of what non-public non law 280 tribes received. So we need direct funding to tribes who are providing the solutions in their communities. We need regular funding for this effort that we can count on from year to year. In addition, 
um, funding barriers um, regarding domestic violence programs. While U.S. DOJ has attempted to direct funding towards domestic violence and sexual assault, many federal programs do not allow us to spend money to serve perpetrators. If we can't get our perpetrators healthy, then we're setting them up for failure and more abuse of our women and children. Finally, we need equal access to the national database for legitimate governmental purposes. In 2015, DOJ created the Tribal Access Program, also known as TAP, which provides eligible tribes with access to the criminal justice information system. There are two issues with this access. One, we need a dedicated funding stream created for expanding the TAP program and making it available to all interested tribes. Two, we need an amendment to what was a what was originally an appropriation statute, Public Law 92-544, but has been codified in 34 U.S. Code 41101. This statute allows states to legislate for legitimate governmental purposes to access the criminal database. We need to be included in this statute and need a technical fix. Right now, we can only access the database through a state or federal purpose. We cannot legislate for our needs. Tribes have the same legitimate governmental needs for access to these records for possible elected official background checks, a person overseeing the tribe's finances, or caretaking for our elders. We need to be able to create these laws and put them in place to ensure the safety and health of our communities like any other sovereign. Instead, tribes have to use FBI channelers, non-governmental agencies who have access to these databases for these legitimate governmental purposes tribes should not be prejudiced. I have copies of the proposed fix with your staff. It just is two um, amendments t with three words, and I am told that the Department of Justice supports this amendment. So, in summary, fully fund all tribal governmental needs regardless of whether a tribe is located in PL 280 state, expand grant programs that take into account the unique circumstances of Alaska tribes, direct DOJ to create funding for perpetrators of gender-based violence, and amend 34 U.S. Code 41101. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to our concerns. We look forward to the results of this committee. Good morning. Um, my name is Tammy truitt Drew. I'm a citizen of the Anvik tribe on the lower Yukon in Alaska. Um, we're a Degaton Athabascan tribe, extremely remote, Adet. Um, I am, uh, I have just recently actually moved out of Anvik and moved to Fairbanks recently to take over the uh, direction of the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center that I am also the executive director of. The Anvik tribe has asked me to speak today regarding uh, the following House Appropriations considerations, support of the authority of the Alaska Native tribal governments to design and carry out local, culturally relevant solutions to public safety and justice by appropriating funds specifically for Alaska tribes, develop and strengthen tribal law enforcement and judici judicial responses. The past three years, we've seen new Department of Interior Office of Justice Services tribal justice support appropriations for tribes in PL 280 states. In the past year, there was a $10 million appropriation regarding uh, tribes and tribal courts in PL 280 states. We thank the committee and we ask that you continue funding this program and consider an increase and support comprehensive tribal justice services as defined by the Alaska tribes beyond funding only tribal courts. Provide dedicated federal funding through the Department of Justice and Department of Interior's various laws enforcement programs for Alaska tribal law enforcement training and officers to Alaska Native tribal governments since the state of Alaska has seriously underfunded and actually cut state funding for the VPSO or the Village Public Safety um, Officers to ensure the greatest accountability. A continue appropriating increased tribal funding under 42 U.S.C. Chapter 110, the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act within the Department of Health and Human Services for life-saving shelter and supportive services to ensure adequate shelter services are accessible in the villages for Native women. Current appropriations for the tribal governments are at 10 percent funding stream plus the 7 million that was appropriated. Thank you very much for that extra appropriations. Uh, continue appropriating dedicated tribal funding under the Victims of Crime Act to support much needed tribal crime victim services designed and managed by tribal governments. I think that's imperative. 
were designed and managed by tribal governments. The Anvik tribe is a Degaton Athabascan community with a rich history. We're located on the west bank of the Yukon River in the interior of Alaska. We are an isolated tribe with 378 enrolled members with only 100 members living on our tribal traditional lands. Access to Anvik is by small plane, boat, or snow machine, depending on the season. With permission and support of the Anvik Tribal Council, I am here today to testify in the harsh realities that we face every day. When we talk about public safety and justice for Alaska tribes, it's a complex, very complex discussion. Chapter 2 of the 2013 Indian Law and Order Commission report to Congress and the President documents very well our challenges and barriers. Like over half of Alaska's tribes, ANVIC does not have law enforcement and continues to not have law enforcement. This absence of law enforcement combined with other challenges facing Alaska tribes results in an unacceptable lack of public safety and justice. Lack of resources such as safe shelter, sexual assault advocacy, crisis services, jails, treatment, and other interventions continue to impact victims, survivors, and their families, the community, and the perpetrators. My home has often been the safe house in our community, in many instances. For victims and their children of violence, some villages have these safe houses and some do not have that opportunity. My husband was a former chief for 28 years, and other tribal citizens who are the interveners basically in any kind of op um, anything that happens oftentimes in terms of crisis, including the dangerous ones. Given the lack of law enforcement and resources, we respond to violence, search and rescue, medical emergencies, and deaths. Is there a law enforcement? Not law enforcement as defined by the state or federal government, but tribal citizens have had to maintain order as best they can to keep women and children and others safe. This is a common occurrence in our rural communities in Alaska, and unfortunately, has become a normal part of village life. At this point in time, ANVIC does not have law enforcement again. The only other law enforcement options are the Alaska State Troopers who are located in Antioch, a hub community that's an hour and a half by airplane away from the community, and they're responsible for 46 other remote and rural communities. And they take two week on, two week off, so there's never more than two troopers on at the post at one time. ANVIC often has impassable weather for days, leaving victims vulnerable and crimes neglected. This seems like an unending complaint, but in reality, we're repeating ourselves. To help understand the unique conditions that exist in Alaska and all over the U.S. demand that we become creative and resourceful in our ability to provide that response. As I just shared, there's been a consistent pattern of inadequate state law enforcement response and a lack of federal appropriations for tribal justice responses, including the lack of comprehensive system systemic infrastructure to address safety and accountability for the extreme levels of domestic and sexual violence in Alaska's villages. Please review the findings and recommendations from the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights 2018 briefing report titled Broken Promises, Continuing Federal Funding Shortfall for Native Americans. Since the U.S. purchased the Alaska, I will go ahead and cut this short a little bit and go. I do want to repeat a quote that my daughter. Uh, I'm, I'm okay, I'm doing that because I was going to pull it out and make sure you read it. Okay, please. Um, my daughter had the opportunity to uh, provide testimony at the 2019 annual Violence Against Women Government to Government Tribal Consultation. Uh, consultation. She said, "As a young girl, I had never imagined." that I would have to be here today pleading to have adequate funding and assistance to protect my sisters, my aunts, my cousins. I had sworn that I wouldn't get into this line of work because I saw the toll it took on my mother and my family. I have seen how hard our advocates work with little resources that they have. I've seen how hard our people are trying to make a change. I am honored, but I'm also saddened that I am here as the next generation to provide my testimony on the realities that we face day in and day out. And as her mother, of course, I'm very proud of her, but I really am not proud that she has to continue telling this same message. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that. That was very powerful when I read it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've read it twice, and uh, when we do our final vote on the passage for women, Against Violence Act, I'm going to submit that as part of my statement to the record. Thank you for sharing that. Thank your daughter for her work. Mm -hmm. My daughter's in the, been in similar lines of work, but mm -hmm. not facing the same challenges that you and your daughter and your sisters are facing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Kilmer, do you have a question? Yes, Concern? thank you for your testimony. Mr. Joyce, welcome. I told people you wanted us to get going so that we didn't hold anybody up. Thank you for your professional courtesy. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate your uh, moving forward because I, I apologize for being late. It was at a, a breakfast of tribal members uh, that uh, Congressman Cole was ho hosting. And even though I said I was getting out on time, they, they we kept chatting. So I appreciate the opportunity for all you to be here. And I know, uh, <coughs> Chairman, uh, we, I missed your testimony, but I know that you have a very interesting thing on juvenile justice. Could you explain why the BIA is refusing to fund that? Uh, on that issue, what we have learned is that um, on the juvenile detainees is that, uh, is that in spite of uh, the, 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 the services being in our uh, scope of work within our 638 contract, in spite of that, um, the BIA has, is only funding direct service tribes and not 638 tribes like us. You know, Congress intended us to grow as a people, to empower ourselves and to enhance our sovereignty by providing this opportunity to, to contract through the Self-Determination Act. So that's what we have done. And it seems like we're being penalized to enhance our growth and, and these funds are just reserved for the direct service tribes. And whatever is there, I know is not sufficient as it is to Sorry to hear that. It was something we could talk about mm -hmm. and look forward to working with all. And thank you all for being here. It was a powerful testimony. Um, I have, so, um, Chairman Rambler, when it, the language that you referred to with the cap is something that we sought to remove on the House side. Um, you, if you would talk to uh, our colleagues in the Senate, I think that's something that we're hopeful that we could get removed. They, I don't. It's awkward to say, but I'm going to say it. I don't think the Senate understood <laughs> the impact of that language. We do, and um, if you could share that with um, either the council or with uh, some of the, the members, both on the appropriations or the authorization, I think we can, I think we can see that go go away. I sure will. Okay. Um, the EPA. Uh, under the president's budget uh, had uh, severe cuts into the clean drinking water program. That was the president's, um, you know, he proposed that. Um, we're going to protect clean drinking water out of this subcommittee we did, we did uh, last, last Congress uh, bipartisanly, we'll do it again this Congress. So the, um, we hope to uh, be able to see your project um, move forward. So thank you for, for sharing with that. And then, um, you know, th this time and time again is very frustrating for us. We make it very clear that we expect the BIA, Department of Interior, the Dep Bureau of Indian Education, IHS, we expect all of them to do meaningful, deliberate, thoughtful, fully participatory co consultation. And it's a great frustration to all of us when they hear that they're not doing that. And we have been trying to get their attention and we're going to have to maybe figure out a way to get there uh, to really make sure that we have their attention. I know this is something that um, our Senate colleagues feel frustration with too. So um, don't feel like it's, a, it's repeating a broken promise to us on consultation is something we don't want to hear. We, we want to hear that. So thank you for sharing that. The public laws uh, that um, you uh, too eloquent who spoke on behalf of our sisters whose lives are under, you know, threat and intimidation. Um, we're going to, they have to go through either the authorizing committee, maybe we can start in um, either in the justice uh, um, committee or we can start in the authorization for natural resources. We'll, we'd like to work with you on that because they're, they're not even public laws that I, uh, I on this committee with my colleagues, uh, you know, directly are involved with. For us to put something like that in an appropriations bill could be a uh, fool's errand because it could land up coming out on the floor uh, because of um, uh, jurisdictional issues. And then I don't want to start down, start down a road that's not going to have a, a good ending for us. So we would like to work with you to resolve that, but that is something 
at this time that we would be we would find very difficult. The TAP funds, I will bring that up to um, our colleague, and I know Mr. Joyce will bring it up with um, the ranking member of that Appropriations Committee too. And thank you for sharing that though, because they don't have the public witness for Native American um, improvements the way that we do. So this gives us an opportunity to have a, a conversation with um, our colleagues. So thank you all for your testimony. We took lots of notes and um, we look forward to um, moving together um, to make sure that Indian country uh, has the justice it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. If the second panel would please come up. And we'll switch out the, the name plates. Good morning. So once again, um, green, the green light will start after, after you start your testimony. So please introduce yourself, start your testimony. The light will go on for five minutes. The yellow will mean one minute of remaining. And then um, the red means please conclude. So if you would lead us off, sir. Thank you and welcome. Good morning, Chairwoman uh, McCollum and members of the committee. My name is Rodney Bordo. I'm president of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. <clears throat> I want to thank you, Chairwoman, for coming out to Rosebud last October. We appreciate it, and we, we, uh, we're glad to host you. The Rosebud Sioux Tribe is amongst the top 10 land-based tribes in the United States. Our land consists of approximately, approximately a million acres. We have close to 35,000 enrolled tribal members, 30,000 of which live on or near our reservation. So our current, um, through our 1851 and 1868 treaties, with the United States, we have ceded millions of acres of land and have remained steadfast and resolute in our pledge of peace and have, in exchange for U.S. agreeing to ensure that our lands remain livable and peaceful. The key responsibility of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and the U.S. is to provide public safety and justice services to our tribal members, others living and working on our lands, as well as the general public visiting and traveling through our reservation. Some of our main priorities are our Rosebud, are our adult correctional facility and the juvenile detention center. Our, our ACF, which is the adult correctional facility, is, has a 220 bed facility and houses 130 inmates on the average. 89% of the population is meth related, I mean in terms of arrests. The facility is in need of $600,000 in additional funding for personnel, food, transport, training, and counseling services. Our JDC, Juvenile Detention Center, has 21 employees and has a need for 30. This facility has a lot of structural problems and we basically need a new facility. Our law enforcement services covering the 1 million acres responds to 22,000 Call, service calls every year. At this, we only have 25 officers and four criminal investigators. So we need additional 20 officers at a cost of around approximately a million dollars. And we need to acquire 20 additional police units at approximate cost of 800,000. <coughs> to give you an idea of the magnitude of our meth problem, last week our officers busted, confiscated and bust, busted a young lady and we recovered three pounds of meth, marijuana, and opioids. The street value of the meth alone came about 240,000. So we're making aggressive, we're really aggressive in our uh, bust, and we're leading all the tribes in our area in, in regard to bust. So, 
So despite our um, funding levels, uh, we're working with local counties, uh, sheriffs, departments, city officers, and we're developing memorandum of agreement. We're also working with, uh, since we're in South Central South Dakota, we're working with uh, Cherry County in Nebraska, law enforcement, and we have good relationships with them. We share information, and we're going forward, and, uh, and, and those departments are, are very vastly uh, underfunded as well, so they don't bring nothing to the table, just sharing information and working together. So despite that, uh, uh, we, um, we're building a good relationship. Although we are opposed to the Keystone XL pipeline that will be coming through our territories, um, there's a likelihood that it may begin construction in August 2020. With that comes the man camp, so we, want, we must protect our women and children, and uh, we support the Violence Against Women Act, reauthorization with enhanced tribal jurisdiction. Our tribal cor courts, we have a current budget of $1.5 million with BI and other grant funding, and the grant funding is conditional. It's not very, very, uh, it's very limited. So we request another 500,000 to keep our current levels of funding. A new courthouse we, uh, is a facility built in the 80s, and it's just seen its day. So we need a new, new courthouse facility. And uh, we're working with A&E firm on trying to get some figures in that regard. Another big service that provides uh, needed Ambulatory is our ambulance service. It was fund, founded in 1968, and it was the first American Indian law uh, ambulance service in the country. It serves over 30,000 tribal members 24 hours a day and responds to 6,000 calls on average per year. It remains chronically underfunded, and the uh, Indian Health Service does not provide any funding for medical transports and mental health patients, and it's kind of dangerous for our crews, so we're working with IHS to resolve that issue. And it's it's uh, it's their job to do that, and they don't buy the funding for that. So, in conclusion, we need a detox facility, a new JDC facility, a new courthouse slash justice center, and a new ambulance facility, uh, as well as increase uh, law enforcement and court personnel costs. We would like you to explore options to combine public safety related funding from the Interior, Health and Human Services and the Justice Department that would allow tribes to on a need-based criteria. Thank you. 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 Thank Good day, honorable friends. Thank you for this time on the floor. My name is Thank Stopes. My English name is David Bean, and I'm the chairman of the Puyallup Tribe. The Puyallup Tribal Council is responsible for providing for our 5,500 members and 25,000 Native Americans who live within our service area. We provide health care services, educational services, social services, public safety services, and a, and a myriad of social service programs to people in our community. As people in our community rely on the continued resources and support through federal appropriations which reflect the trust, responsibility, and treaty obligations to American Indians and Alaska Natives and tribes. Today I'm going to talk about the tribe's top priority, public safety. Keeping citizens safe and secure is the most basic of duties for any government. This is no less true for tribes. My focus today on public safety is the result of a summer that, uh, this past summer that none of us ever want to relive. There were a series of shootings on and near our reservation resulting in seven people being hospitalized and three dead. Our staff, our staff, they felt terrorized. Our council struggled between balancing the concerns and safety of our staff with providing services to our community. This occurred in the height of summer when people are outside enjoying the warm sun, enjoying the beautiful Northwest, where, you know, a time when our communities are celebrating one another this occurred in a place where our, our families are supposed to feel safe, where our employees are supposed to feel safe in their work environment, where our kids are supposed to play outside without fear of any stray bullets. Our law enforcement staff, they worked 12 hour days, six days a week. They're tired. They tell me that this uh, escalating violence is associated with the resurgence of gang violence. 
At one time, we identified 28 gangs within our reservation. We worked collaborative, collaboratively with our neighboring governments and fellow partners to address this gang problem. Unfortunately, what we now know today is that the gangs did not go away. They moved. The gang activity that, that they're involved in, drug trafficking, human trafficking, weapon sales, and turf wars moved with them. They moved blocks away from our administration and our housing community, our tribal housing developments. They moved within blocks of our administration, our elder center, and our health facility. We were in the middle of a deadly game of whack-a-mole. What we are lacking is dedicated federal resources needed to combat this problem. Our officers, like I stated a moment ago, are working numerous hours of overtime. And when we reached out to the BIA, we were told that they had no resources to help us. The BIA's response was simply inadequate. It was irresponsible. It left me wondering how the BIA found resources to send multiple law enforcement agents to set up, to set up a command center to monitor and arrest people who were engaged in what was one of the most historic and positive gatherings in Indian people in a generation at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. But they could not find even one officer to send to help us during our time of crisis, during our, during our time of fear, during a time of terror. Apparently, oil pipelines are more important than our tribal health centers and our elders care centers. And in short, I said it once and I'll say it again, our officers are tired and they need reinforcements. We ask that the subcommittee provide increased funding for tribes like Puyallup who are in PL 280 states and have received minimal directed law enforcement funding from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. A critical part of our law enforcement program is our detention facility. We have a 28-bed adult correction facility. We work closely with the OJS to develop an agreed-upon operating cost of $2.7 million. Sadly, the BIA only provides 26% of the need to operate the facility. We appreciate the $105 million that Congress provided for additional correctional detention centers. We know this is not enough to keep pace with inflation. This is not enough to make the Puyallup tribe whole for the job that we are doing on behalf of the United States government. This is equally true for our tribal courts and programs. As I conclude my remarks, I do want to express the tribe's strong support for our natural resource programs. As we work to make our community safer, we must work to make it healthier. This means strong support for our natural resources programs, which are critical to our culture, our lifestyle, and our diets. We also want to emphasize the need for increased funding for BIE for our Chief Leschi School. And finally, I would be remiss if I did not join my fellow tribal leaders in calling for increased funding for Indian Health Service. We support the comments and testimony of the Northwest, Northwest Indian Fish Commission as well. Thank you for this time on the floor. Mr. Peterson, before, before you start, we've had a group of young Native American leaders, the future, walk into the room and um, if one of you would come forward and identify what group you're with, that would be terrific. And thank you so much for being here. Just press the little red button there. Good morning. Um, my name is Tyler Owens, and I come from the Gila River Indian community. Here we have uh, three members of our Akamura Atlampi Posh Youth Council that has uh, been going for over 25, 30 years. Um, and we are one of the longest standing tribal uh, youth councils that takes place in the U.S., as well as we have our junior Miss Healy River and myself, our Miss Healy River here. Thank you, you are for having so, us. We are so welcome uh, to have you here, and we look forward to you taking good care of uh, not only Indian country, but the United States, uh, our future leaders here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for indulging. Nope, happy, happy. Is it working? Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Rick Peterson. I am the tribal chairman of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa in northern Wisconsin. Um, I come here to, well, first I want to thank uh, Chairwoman McCallum and the committee for uh, allowing us to uh, come and um, voice our concerns. Um, I was here last year and another time before, um, um, and I 
what I'm here for echoes the um, testimony of my fellow tribal leaders since I've been sitting in this room. Um, I have two issues today. Um, again, I bring back the issue of the need to increase the funding for tribal police departments. Um, our police department, um, it, we, um, well, the drug epidemic, as we know, uh, the meth especially, um, is, is, is um, our community is under assault by the meth. And um, the funding that we get from the BIA is totally inadequate. Our budget um, for that we submitted um, was for over 500,000. It's for we have a five uh, member police force. Um, we were awarded $160,000 um, multiple times. We have put in for end of year funding uh, for equipment. Our police, uh, our police chief, um, he had the newest vehicle and his vehicle was 12 years old. Um, we again put in for end of year funding last year and we were given some, but police equipment was not part of it, vehicles. Um, I want to tell you a little story about what we had to do to get new police vehicles. We reached out to another tribe in Wisconsin and asked if they would help fund two new police vehicles for us. That's a travesty. It really is. Um, we thank um, the Forest County Potawatomi Tribe of Wisconsin for, uh, for funding that. Um, they gave us enough money to get two new police vehicles. Um, but this is an ongoing problem. This is, uh, you, you know, uh, th th this is something that not only our our tribe faces, but tribes throughout Indian country face. Um, we are doing our best to fight these um, these uh, issues, the the these drug related issues. The with the drug related issues, our police department is inc increasingly stretched. ICW, our cases have have increased tenfold. And every time ICW staff has to go to a house, who do they have, they, they, it requires a police officer to be there. Um, they're, they're so inadequate, in, so inadequately funding and um, funded. Um, and I bring, the, you know, I come back to the table again asking that the Appropriations um, Committee um, increase the, the the base level funding. We need to depend on that money year in, year out. Right now we don't. You know, every year, we, you, you know, we, we, we ask ourselves, are we gonna be able to support this police department a year from now? And that's a question that we can't plan around. Um, the second item I'm here for is the increase, uh, is the um, need for the BIA to increase the funding for tribal roads departments. Um, our tribal roads department, um, I'll, 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 I'll read a statement here. Um, th that um, This is the Redcliffe Band of Lake Superior Chippewa has reached a critical impasse in its, inabil in its ability to effectively maintain BIA roads within the reservation boundaries. This is due to the practice of deferring maintenance due to the lack of funding provided in self-determination contracts with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. All reasonable attempts have been made to secure additional funding to meet the needs of the programs, including U.S. and Wisconsin Departments of Transportation, Housing, Urban Development, and BIA programs um, to pro provide new equipment and maintenance facility. With that statement, I want to wrap up. I'm running out of time here. Um, in Right around Thanksgiving, we had a storm where we had three feet of snow overnight. Our community was shut down for five days. Every piece of equipment we had broke down. Our graders, 25 years old, there was an emergency call in the middle of the night. The ambulance got stuck in the middle of the road for two hours. Community members had to come out with their trucks to plow them out. Again, um, as I mentioned with the police vehicles, this is a travesty and we need we, we need to, it, it, it it's it's a health and safety issue now be which thank you thank you Please. good morning chairwoman mccollum ranking member joyce and honorable members of the subcommittee can you hear me okay 
My name is Tracy Trepa. I'm the vice chairperson of Hub Emmental Palm Wolf Upper Lake. We are um, located um, in a rural county just south, I'm sorry, northwest of Sacramento. Um, like most tribes, we have had a complicated and often tragic relationship with the federal government. My people survived the U.S. Army's attack during the Bloody Island Massacre. We persevered through termination. We've overcome the loss of our lands, and today we are still here and committed to building a better tribal nation for the next generation of Habemetal children. We have just under 300 tribal members and a land base of 11.24 acres. The tribe's executive council is working to restore our lands, provide for our children, and build a robust tribal legal system to, pr to protect the rule of law. Today I want to d discuss two funding priorities that are absolutely essential to the rule of law in fostering healthy and safe communities. The first is tribal court funding for tribes in public law 280 states, and the second is funding for private safety training. I will address those priorities now. Tribal courts are essential to the effective exercise of tribal sovereignty. Tribal courts administer justice in our communities, provide a forum for tribes to receive child welfare cases, and ensure that law and order is upheld and protected. Unf unfortunately, for years, tribes located in PL-280 states have not had access to federal funding to create and sustain tribal court systems. This lack of resources hindered my own tribe's ability to create a court. For years, the BIA prioritized tribes in non-public law 280 states since the federal government was primarily responsible for criminal jurisdiction in Indian country there. That left tribes in public law 280 states such as California with no federal support to create or sustain a tribal judiciary. The Habemetal advocated for change and pleaded with Congress to provide us with the same tribal court funding support as tribes in non-public law 280 states receive. Fortunately, in 2015, Congress acted and required the BIA to quantify how much it would cost to provide tribal court funding to tribes in PL 280 states. The BIA sent a report to Congress which found that it funded tribal courts in non-PL 280 states at a mere 6.14 percent of the true cost of operating and supporting the court. Further, the report estimated it would cost 1.69 million to fund, I'm sorry, to to fund tribal courts in public law 280 states at the same level. The BIA's report noted that while 1. We're fine. Okay, 16.9 million would not be widely viewed as robust or perhaps even adequate. It would match existing levels of funding in non pl 280 states which reflect a cons constrained fiscal environment. Congress took the BIA's report and acted quickly to appropriate money for tribes in PL-280 states. In 2016, Consolidated Act, App Appropriations Act, Congress made $10 million in tribal court funding available to tribes in PL-280 states. This was the first time that ever happened. After this law was passed, our tribe submitted a funding request to the BIA to help us create a tribal judiciary. The BIA awarded us $72,000 to begin the work on, on the system. This may not seem like much, but our tribe has made a significant difference. It allowed us to cover the startup costs that pr previously had hindered our ability to create a judiciary. The tribe used the funds to develop a judicial code, court rules, bench book, child welfare code, and conduct site visits to other tribal courts. I am proud to say that now the legal infrastructure has been created to support our judiciary. We will be looking to retain our first judge and begin hearing cases within a year. This would not be possible without the support of the subcommittee and funding directed to tribal courts in PL-280 states. I strongly urge you to retain this funding and expand upon it. The second priority I want to discuss is funding for public safety training. The tribe strongly supports the mission of the BA's mm -hmm. Office of Justice, or OJS, and, it supports, and its support for training opportunities in Indian Country. The tribe received funding from OJS in 2019 to host a jurisdictional training in our homelands. The training took place in February of last year. This intergovernmental event convened tribal, state, local, and fev federal governments and governmental agencies. The training covered PL-280 jurisdiction, Violence Against Women Act, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and the opioid crisis. It was great to see the different governments and government agencies come together to learn how each of our jurisdictions interact and impact 
the others. Um, the event was one of the biggest and most diverse intergovernmental trainings to ever take place in Lake County. We have seen a noticeable positive impact in our coordination with neighboring jurisdictions. Um, the tribe appreciates Congress commitment to fund these trainings opportunities and we strongly encourage the subcommittee to maintain and expand these training, training funds. That concludes my testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Kelman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks each of you for your testimony. Uh, Chairman Bean, I want to um, thank you for your testimony. Your words are important. Um, your work is really important, too. You, you appropriately called out just how big a role the tribe plays in employment in our region and providing services in our region, uh, natural resource leadership. And um, I know this is a public safety panel, but I want to um, just have you speak a bit to the work that the tribe is doing around natural resources and how important those issues are from a treaty rights standpoint, from uh, the standpoint of, uh, of the economics and culture of your tribe. Thank you, Congressman. That's a, that's a great question. And you know, when we signed the, the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854, the, the, that treaty guaranteed our right to, to fish and hunt and gather, uh, as we have done so since the beginning of time. And you know, we're, we are partners with the federal government in protecting the natural resources. And that extends to protecting the habitat that provides nourishment and protection uh, for our natural resources, be it fish, elk, uh, roots and berries. You know, it's a part of our, our, our way of life. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of our DNA. And so it's vitally important. These natural resources are under attack by natural threats and man-made threats. And we need our federal partners' help in protecting the habitat and, and continuing to um, raise fish in our hatcheries that benefit not just tribes but non-native fishermen throughout the state of Washington. It's, it's vital to the economy in the state of Washington. It's vital to tribal economies. It's vital to our culture and our traditional ways. You know, we're, we're taught that we're connected to Mother Earth and that, uh, you know, being salmon people, we're, we're taught that when our, our salmon uh, go away, then, then we cease to exist. And, uh, you know, for, for the first time in many years, our fishermen are sitting on the banks of the river. There are no fish for our, our fishermen to catch. You know, we're having ceremonies. When we open our ceremonies, there are no fish to, to open our ceremonies. And that is something we've never seen before. So we, we need our federal government's help in, in protecting our, our salmon and our natural resources. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for coming today and for your testimony. Uh, not picking on you, Chairman Bean, but uh, I want to go back to you. And I heard you talking about how you, you do get some funds from BIA and then you supplement them with your own funds. But I don't believe I heard you discuss the Department of Justice or any of the grants that are, are available for those ty that type of help. Um, is there a reason? We, we turn over every stone and we apply for every grant available and, and it's Quite simply, the funding's not there. Um, so do you think it might be better if Department of Justice moved that money to the BIA and let them uh, award it in the grant programs? I would love to see, you know, some just additional funding in whatever form, <laughs> in whatever form, because, for example, what, with limited time, I didn't get to talk about, you know, our law enforcement program is, is a $5 million budget. Um, the BIA provides... 10% uh, of that, which means the tribe is carrying the water for our federal relatives and carrying the, the, the trust responsibility to not just our Puyallup tribal community, but the 25,000 natives that live um, in and on and around our reservation on, on top of our, our non-native neighbors. You know, we're, we're doing our best to stretch the resources. So however Congress sees fit, to, we, we welcome expanded funding because the need and what is actually provided to meet that need is vastly different. Um, we're working with the, our, our neighboring jurisdictions. You know, we're, we're thankful for the city of Tacoma Police Department, uh, Pierce County Sheriff, and, and, and the State Patrol. You know, they came and they responded uh, during the gang violence this, this summer. And um, but we're, we're having to partner with them and we're having to share resources. And so when, when Congress sends money to, to tribes, or states, is it, it's not just benefiting one over the other, it's, it's benefiting the region. So we welcome um, expanded resources however we can get them, sir. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for coming.
Um, can I ask? If people were leaving, I'm going to ask a question. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so one of the things that um, I heard, and I'm glad that you brought it up, especially with what's happening in Rosebud, is meth is still a problem. And there's been so much focus on opioids, and rightly so because pharmaceutical companies, um, uh, through deceptive marketing, hooked you know millions and millions of Americans in Indian country and throughout out the country. But meth is still a huge problem, and it pre prevents different challenges for law enforcement and for communities in general. Um, so um, I'm assuming <coughs> that you're seeing. Um, where there, if someone is uh, cooking and manufacturing meth in a house, all of a sudden you lose housing on a reservation. Yeah. That, that, that's correct. Um, thank you for, for um, pointing that out. So the whole issue about you know, grants kind of looking at each other, I think one of the challenges and frustrations that I've had is tribal nations have to have you know, like full-time grant writers. And that costs money out of the tribal budgets to begin with. And then if you're applying to a Department of Justice grant and a BIA grant and, and one comes through but the other one doesn't come through, you don't have the holistic approach that you need. So um, I would like to try to, um, Mr. Uh, Cole and I um, were, have been kind of um, working together on, on kind of consolidating some of the health care needs. We're not there yet, but at least we're having those discussions, so I want you to know I'm going to reach out um, along with Mr. Joyce to our colleagues on, on the other committees that, that you apply for grants. Do you have any um, anything that you know, Mr. Joyce and Mr. Kilmer and I should kind of keep in the back of our head when we talk to our colleagues about what, what would a grant application look like if you're applying to different agencies to solve a problem. What, if you can give me one or two things that I should be thinking about as I have the conversation with my colleagues. Uh, thank you for raising that issue. And uh, just to be clear, I, I, I want to make sure that uh, tribes, we do our best to leave no stone unturned. So the, the lack of funding, it, it's not for a lack of effort. You know, they're, they're highly competitive and there are complex formulas. So if you, you simplify the formula, and, and it, it's just competitive. If you have a, a, a larger population, guess what? Then the, the funds follow the larger population into a, a small tribe. You know, how do we compete with uh, tribes with larger populations? And so I think that's one thing to be mindful of because while we are 5,500, we serve a, a native population of 25,000. City of Tacoma is a, um, a uh, part of the federal relocation efforts that's resulted in this large populations of, of natives from over, you know, 200 tribes across the United States. Now, if we go up against a tribe that, say, for example, has you know, 50, 60,000 member population or a quarter million population, it, 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 the, com the competition is just not there. We're, we're, we're considered a small tribe, but we provide for a lot of people much larger than our, the size of our enrollment. That, that's, that's a great point to make. And um, Mr. Peterson, um, I know what you mean about our rural communities being extraordinarily isolated. I've been in your part of Wisconsin, and you are very isolated, whether it's a, a blowdown, a tornado, a snowstorm, and not to have the right equipment to get in. It, it can take hours and, as you said, days um, to take care of uh, people. You can lose electricity, and then you're not charging your cell phone. I mean, it's just, it's a whole cascading um, effect. Um, so when you, um, Look at doing equipment grants. Your life, health, and safety really isn't one of the the factors that comes in into it when when you're applying for road maintenance uh, help for for graders and things like that, is it? No, it, no it, it's it's not at all. Um, and that would definitely, um, it, you know, adding that aspect to a, to a, to any sort of a grant application. Um, even if it was a single question, I believe um, would open the eyes and of you know the uh, the reality of the situation that we face. Um, our equipment, like I said, every every piece of major equipment that we had failed. Our graders, 25 years old, um, our trucks are zip tied together, <laughs> and I I don't say that sarcastically. Um, 
the we had to we are we are not in any means a wealthy tribe we had to take money that we don't have and we had to hire private contractors to come in and clear federal roads and clear, and, and 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 take away the uh, snow we we we, act, we actually had to um, yeah get construction companies to come in and remove the snow because our equipment was all down that's the reality of what we face you know certain weather event we i'm from minnesota certain weather events can trigger can trigger a natural disaster um, response, uh, FEMA, um, other kind of help, but snow-related events and extreme cold weather events don't qualify for that, uh, only under very, very, very few few circumstances. And by the time the help gets there, um, you know, people have really suffered. So th thank you for bringing that up. And that's what's so great about having such a diverse panel. Yes, did you want to add something? Yeah, I'd, like to, <clears throat> I'd like to add in regard to um, public law. 102477. I think there's a good model for DOJ to work with the Department of Interior and the tribes to create a good uh, model for that funding. You talked about, yeah. it, you know, CTAS and all that coming over to the Bureau. I think if you can call on Interior to develop a plan for that, I think that'll, that'll really, really work for us. Well, we want Interior to develop a plan, but also do it with consultation. So, exactly. and, and congratulations on moving forward in California. Thank you all for your testimony and your time. Thank you. I had my cell phone out because I was looking up what the DEA did. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> I'm, I'm right behind you tomorrow. And our next panel, if our next panel on uh, public safety and justice could come forward to the table, please. So we'll wait for a second for the door to close and for the other panel to leave. Thank you all for being here. Um, five minutes to testify. Your introduction does not count against those five minutes. Yellow light, one minute remaining, red light, and then I have to start thinking about lightly tapping with the gavel. So, Good morning, sir, if you would please lead us off. Good morning, Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kevin Alice. I'm an enrolled member of the Forest County Pottawatomie community in Wisconsin. Very proud to hear that my tribe assisted a neighboring tribe with their situation. I'm also the CEO of the National Congress of American Indians. So my testimony is uh, Chairwoman, Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee, thank you again for holding this hearing on tribal appropriations priorities. My name is Kevin Alice, enrolled member of Forest County Pottawatomie Community, CEO of National Congress of American Indians. And I will say I have 10 years as a Baltimore City police officer, so I was on the front lines of law enforcement and criminal justice and know what happens to communities when the resources and the personnel aren't there to, to make it happen. NCAI's requests are rooted in the treaties and agreements that our tribal nations made with the United States government. However, as you know, recent assessment by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights founded that federal funding for Native American programs across government remains grossly inadequate to meet the most basic needs the federal government is obligated to provide. Tribal leaders and citizens have known for decades, and we urge Congress to fully fund the U.S. government's treaty and statutory obligations. Before talking about our specific requests, I'd like to address the significant challenges tribal nations must contend with due to persisting uncertainty in the federal budget process. Last year's government shutdown was particularly a prominent example of the negative effects of breakdowns in the federal budget process, but tribal nations also must regularly contend with uncertainty when planning and delivering services to their citizens because of Congress's reliance on short-term continuing resolutions.
basic health care provided by AH IIHS and essential services like law enforcement and emergency response provided by the BIA, BIA are regularly impacted. NCAI for years has urged Congress to provide advance appropriations for IHS and BIA to protect tribal programs from further uncertainty. And I thank the leadership and members of this subcommittee for your support of this legislation. As we did last year, NCAI chose Pacific, uh, public safety and justice programs to focus on today because it's one of the most fundamental aspects of federal government's trust responsibility. The BIA is required to submit unmet needs report in this area every year and based on past assessments to provide minimum base level service to all federally recognized tribes, one billion is needed for law enforcement, one billion for tribal courts, and 222 million are needed for <coughs> tribal detention. At about 40 percent of the need, tribal courts receive about 5 percent of the need, and law enforcement is only receiving about 20 percent of the need. We'll not be able to address crime and ensure safety in Indian country until our tribal justice systems are adequately funded. Ten years ago, DOI established an initiative to reduce violent crime by at least 5 percent over 24 months on four reservations with high rates of violent crimes. After all four locations received an increase in base funding to support additional sworn officers. The additional resources helped close the capacity gap by bringing the staffing to population ratios closer to the national standard. It worked, producing 35 percent decrease in violent crime across four states. Funding similar to what states and the federal government gets in this area when given to Indian country has been proven to work in the past. Equitable funding for tribal nations needs to, needs to, leads to success. We need sufficient resources to put our tools to work so tribal nations can protect women, children, and families, address substance abuse, rehabilitate first-time offenders, and put serious criminals behind bars. Accordingly, NCA requests a total of $83 million for tribal courts, including those in Public Law 280 jurisdictions. NCA also recommends an increase of $200 million for BIA law enforcement for a total of $573 million. I'd like to add that the inadequacy of BIA-based funding forces tribal nations to seek short-term competitive grants to try to make up a portion of the shortfall. I don't think any of our tribal nations will, will agree with a premise that when we entered into treaties hundreds of years ago and exceeded millions of acres of land, that funding and, and adequate care for these things would be through grants a competitive grant program between the different tribes. That wasn't part of the deal. Short-term competitive grants cannot be viewed as a substitute for base funding. We must have long-term stable funding to address the public safety challenges our tribal nations confront. We res respectfully request both honorable fulfillment of the trust and treaty obligations as well as budget certainty for both IHS and BIA through advance appropriations. The increase NCAI is requesting will be an important incremental step towards providing the resources necessary for tribal nations to ensure public safety on their lands. We only ask for what was promised to us and owed to us when tribal nations entered into treaties <coughs> in exchange for acres of land so settlement could ensue. Thank you very much, and we would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Please, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Chairwoman uh, McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and Honorable Members of the Subcommittee. My name is Jamie Hineo, and I am a member of the Navajo Nation Council and also Chairman of the uh, Budget and Finance Committee for the Council, and also represent the Raymond Navajo uh, community, which is located in the no uh, New Mexico. And so the, our community is a political subunit of the Navajo Nation. And what we have enjoyed is 30 plus years of 638 public law, uh, funding to contract different services for our community, such as law enforcement, real estate, AT tribal government, and most recently, uh, the roads department. So therefore, what uh, we're here is to talk about four areas that we feel is very important. And the first one is the inadequate and funding for tribes that are operating 638 programs and where we should be funded equally with the BIA-operated uh, programs. 
The second one is a lack of funding uh, when it comes to distribution of funds when they're untimely and late. And the third uh, item I'd like to talk about is uh, public safety. And the last item is uh, for road maintenance. So the first one I'd like to expound on is uh, public safety. As expressed earlier by other tribal leaders, public safety is important uh, for our community. We operate a uh, police department that is uh, different from the Navajo Nation police. We have our own police department, which consists of six officers that patrol an area of 15 by 25 um, miles, which is about roughly 400 square miles of uh, uh, land there. But the land is checkerboarded, meaning that it's uh, trust land, allotted land, and also state fee land. So our police officers, they are required to be uh, federally certified and commissioned by the tribe and also state uh, police officers certified too. And so when we pick up young recruits and we take them through the process of taking them through the Indian Police Academy, get them federally certified, then they also are required to go through the New Mexico State Police Academy and they become state peace officer certified. So in the eyes of the New Mexico State Police, Albuquerque, the county, this is a, a prize officer right here. And therefore what happens, they are recruited to the other police agencies and we end up losing uh, uh, thousands and thousands of training dollars, training these young officers for better pay, better packages. So therefore, what we're asking here is for the BIA um, to fully fund the police uh, department in our area. So therefore, we are competitive in pay and benefits. And so we retain our police officers. And of course, uh, equipment is another big issue too. If you were to compare a police unit, the BIA police unit with a Rama office, Rama police unit, you'd see a big disparity where you would see the BIA police officer unit with a lot of antennas and with the Rama police officer with just one antenna, <laughs> meaning that there's no hardly any equipment in the police unit. So that's one of the biggest things that we uh, are asking here for. The other one is um, to have BIA treat uh, the 638 funded programs equally. When it comes to funding distribution, what we are looking at is that BIA decides that, well, let's feed ourselves first, give ourselves the biggest part of the pie, and then whatever crumbs that are remaining, let's take, uh, uh, send them out to Rema and Zuni and Laguna and other tribes that are doing 638 programs. So that's what we are uh, asking the um, appropriation subcommittee is that they uh, put a little bit of pressure on BIA to uh, get their act together, as so to speak, because of the fact that uh, we do provide direct services there at the local community. And just as uh, Mr. Ellis uh, stated earlier, I spent uh, 10 years as a police officer in the rural communities out there too, so I know what it's like to be there by yourself late at night with no backup. And so I understand how what our police officers are going through there in the rural communities. And the last uh, point I wanted to make out is the road transportation. As we speak right now, we have like five, in five inches of wet snow back in our community. And we have a three uh, member um, road crew in our community working almost 24 hours a day cleaning the roads as we speak right now. So therefore, when we contracted the um, road maintenance uh, contract, we also uh, it came with inadequate funding. And therefore, we're asking the subcommittee to take a special note to uh, have this uh, have BIA provide us adequate funding so we could take care of our roads. Because roads is a big issue across uh, the United States, Indian country. Everywhere we go, roads is one of the biggest infrastructure that we have. So therefore, we're asking that we be fully funded uh, to build a sustainable community and future for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, um, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee. Of the committee. I'm so excited to be here today. 
<clears throat> My name is Abigail Echohawk. I'm a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma, and I am the director of the Urban Indian Health Institute and the chief research officer at the Seattle Indian Health Board. I'm here specifically today to talk about the tribal epidemiology centers, which I direct one of. There are 12 nationally. We are under the Indian Health Service. We are established as public health authorities um, under the Affordable Health Care Act. The Urban Indian Health Institute, which I direct, is unique out of the 12. We're the only one with a national focus that looks at the urban Indian population. Urban Indians are tribal people currently living off tribal reservation land, village lands, and urban areas, yet we are regardless we are tribal people regardless of where we live. And so as we look to ensure the health and well-being of our people, the tribal epidemiology centers were established by tribal leadership to ensure that there was quality data for decisions that could be made both at the tribal level, the urban Indian level, and also state and federal. Without us, that data doesn't exist. And I want to provide you an example. The SDPI program, which has had such an incredible impact across Indian country, my organization works every year and provides reports for the urban Indian programs, 31 of them across the country on the outcomes of their SDPI funding every single year so that they can see where they need to direct their efforts. And we know from a paper that was published in 2017 that the largest decrease in end-stage renal failure, direct result of diabetes, is in the American Indian Alaska Native population. And we know from that paper and the data that came out of that 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 is a direct result of the programs like SDPI and other federal efforts to halt diabetes within our communities. And we're doing better than the rest of the country now in decreasing those numbers. With my program, one of the things we do is allow those programs to begin to direct and understand where they need to, on a yearly basis, direct their efforts. However, with the funding that I receive from the Indian Health Service to do this, I don't even have the money for the, the per one person who does this for 31 organizations, and so I supplement her funding with other funding. I can't even print these reports anymore that I give them. I, I used to have money to do that, but it keeps decreasing. I can't even print them off to give them to these organizations. And we have to figure out how to get them their reports in a way that is usable to them. It is one of the hardest things to do is to tell them I can't even simply print what they need. Yet we know this program is so integral to ensuring the health and well-being of our communities. The Tribal Epidemiology Centers do this for a variety of different things. And um, I'm going to switch over now to talking about one of the reasons that I'm so excited to hear all of the uh, tribal leadership today talking about public safety. The urban Indian community is deeply impacted by this also, specifically within the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. When I look at the funding that I get from the Indian Health Service, um, we're looking for an increase for the tribal epidemiology centers because my organization has been the one that has produced the data on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls with three reports that started in 2018. Out of those reports, we have seen significant legislation passed both at the local, the state, and the federal level efforts are being made to change this outcome for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. I self-funded those projects. I had no money to do that. At this point in time, through the tribal epidemiology, Center funds. I provide technical support to tribes and urban Indian organizations, which means they give me a call and I say, you could do it this way, but I can't help you because I don't have the resources to give you the expertise to do this. So we help them to the best of our ability. We're asking for a $24 million increase for all of the tribal epidemiology centers to be split across us to be able to provide this support because we need to gather this information on this crisis of violence against our women and be able to get that to our tribal leadership so they can make these decisions. And we also have to look at the services that are provided. So the urban Indian population, we receive less than 1% of the overall Indian health service budget. We do not want to touch the tribal dollars, but we need an increase in the urban Indian line item. And we're asking for $106 million to do this. And I think to this grandma who I met recently, she had, her daughter was murdered in front of her three young children. She was shot in the head. It took that grandma four months to get her grandchildren out of the foster care system because that county that she lived in, she was not living on tribal lands. That county did not apply the Indian Child Welfare Act and they put those children outside of her home, outside of the family and outside of the tribe. It took her four minutes, or I'm sorry, it took her four months to get those babies back and those children witnessed the murder of their mother and she cannot find them culturally attuned care to treat the psychological 
impacts that are happening to those young babies. And we know that kind of trauma is why we have an opiate crisis. It's why we have a suicide crisis. Unless we address this kind of trauma at the ages when it happens, we are not going to be able to solve any of these things. We'll be sitting at this table 10 years from now. So we have to increase the investment, both for the tribal epidemiology centers, in addition to the urban Indian programs and to all programs through the IHS that serve our people because we cannot continue to let this trauma continue for our young ones. Thank you. Mr. Kilmer. Um, first of all, uh, Ms. Echo Hawk, I just want to thank you for your leadership um, on the issue of m missing and murdered indigenous women um, and girls. Uh, your comments about making sure that not only are, do we have the data, but we also have to have the action to, to address the issue. So thank you for your leadership. Um, Mr. Alice, um, you referenced in your remarks, and I, again, I know this is a public safety and justice panel, but you, mes you mentioned the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Broken Promises report, and you talked about some of the substantial funding shortfalls and the failure of the federal government to step up, specifically in the area of public safety. I wanted to just give you the opportunity. Obviously, that report touched on a whole lot of other areas that the federal government's coming up short. Um, as a leader from NCAI, I want to just give you the opportunity if you wanted to speak to any of those shortcomings as well. I just think it's important. Well, well thank you for that question. And They're so interconnected, right? I mean, when, I mean we could, the, the, one of the important things for the safety, and, and, and I'll link this to public safety, is infrastructure, right? Our roads, our road systems. It's the lifeblood of, of, of the, the, the tribal economy and, and, and safety. In that same report, you know, enormous shortfalls and the backlog of, of, of work that needs to be done. When I speak to some of my tribal leaders in the Great Plains and other parts of the country where their roads are unpassable and they can't, you know, just, they can't get people to the grocery store, let alone try to get them to the, to the hospital or try to respond to some uh, uh, you know, law enforcement situation, it, it, it's, it's really sad. And, 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 and in most of these cases, it's not only the, 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 the low levels or lack of adequate funding. As I mentioned in the grant, it's how it's funded, right? Uh, and a lot of these short-term programs that, that are gap fillers, if you will, and then scattered across numerous different agencies. Also filtered throughout that report is, is, speaks also to the lack of coordination between the different agencies that provide these services, which, you know, moving in the 477 program to try to coordinate and have tribes have more of an impact, we need a lot of work there too as well to try to bring that together. So there, we could talk about that question for, for hours, but I thank you for bringing it up because healthcare, infrastructure, law enforcement, public safety all linked together. I, I feel like it should be mandatory reading for every member of Congress. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. M Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for, for being here and coming here today. Ms. Echo Hawk, on uh, touching on this horrible issue. Uh, I'm part of a panel where we do a, a caucus. We did a, a, a hearing just on this issue on sexual violence. And, and we now have some members of Congress who are uh, uh, Native Americans who brought forth some of the issues. And it's just heartbreaking that we don't use what we have in place in local governments and tribal justice systems to be able to go after these people because one of the most sickening comments I heard was where else would these people go to pray except where they know they're going to get there's nobody really chasing after them and there's no backup and sane nurses and, and cataloging the DNA to go after these folks and it's something we need to continue to address appreciate the fact that all of you are standing up for the justice that needs to be done uh, on your reservation. So thank you very much for your time here today. I just want to put a statistic out there. <coughs> 9726 dollars average per person in the United States spent on health care. $9,726. $4,079 on average per person spent on health care in Indian country. I'm going to round it up. It's almost a sixth 
$1,000 discrepancy. That's why we have health care disparities in part. So um, thank you for um, sharing that. And then your story, Ms. Echohawk, which is repeated time and time again of uh, children witnessing horrific acts of violence affects their school, even how they're going to eat and their nutrition for their growing bodies, their mental health, it impacts them. And we need to have intervention with specialists who are culturally appropriate in, in the area. And so that is, um, that is something that's not as dressed as fully as it could be in the Violence Against Women Act, and that's something that um, when it, even before it comes to up for reauthorization, something we should be focused on. And I know that there's support in the Native American Bipartisan Caucus, as Mr. Joyce was, was pointing out, to, to, to do more, to do more in that. And um, if you added mental health into the numbers that I just gave, it would even be more out of balance. Um, the Affordable Care Act, I just want to also point out, which is in court right now, to uh, eliminate, would eliminate the permanent reauthorization for Indian Health. And um, I don't think that that gets mentioned often enough. Um, and what we need to do to make sure that that's protected. I want to protect the, uh, the Affordable Care Act in its entirety, plus some of us worked very hard to get the permanent reauthorization as, um, as part of that. Um, when it, and, and I think because you talked about um, after a woman, and men are assaulted too, mm -hmm. um, first thing that they usually want to do is try to wipe away the crime, wipe away the violence. Could maybe the three of you just talk in your in your own perspective um, what it means when um, and and to your point when you're training officers and then you can't compete with salary and they go some other place how important it is to have that whole of public safety for the person who's there for witness protection and the rest and and if we keep training people and we can't keep up with the salaries, whether it's witness protection, and I know how little that pays in the private sector. I can hardly imagine what it pays in, in uh, the tribal um, areas. How we're not going to be able to really address um, crime, and if, and if there's, you know, is it equipment, is it wages, is it both? Is it, should we be taking the training dollars out of the way that it's funded and look at a more holistic way of, of, of funding it? Because other people then, other communities, and you don't blame them, take advantage of the training and the resources that you've put into what you're doing. If you could just maybe take a, and I, I, I'm not trying to diminish the importance of this conversation, but if you could just take a minute so the other panel could get started. But give me some more food for thought as I have this discussion with my colleagues. Uh, Chairman, I think you hit on something that, that is, is not only relevant for Indian country, but you, you, the training and, and the environment and the equipment and uh, what the officer will uh, be faced every day they come into the office, right? Uh, they have enormous challenges when they go out on the street and they go out on the reservation, they go out on the roads to, to, to combat crime and, and, and deal with crime. If the police cars and their equipment are substandard stuff, it makes it that much more difficult. And certainly, whatever training they get, and, and if it's a, a higher level of training, they will go to another jurisdiction because they just won't stay there. It's similar to educational systems, you got you got to create, you've got to create an environment from from the minute they walk into the door to the second they get in that patrol car. Um, and, 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 and when they go home and, and be able to take care of their own families, it all has to come together in a way where they, it, 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 they will stay there and you'll have a consistent workforce and, and, and strategy. So um, funding, uh, from the, you know, if we're just talking about law enforcement officers, the training needs to be there and the funding needs to be competitive with other jurisdictions or, or they're just going to roll. They're just going to go somewhere else. So you see that in Indian country, and you see it in metropolitan areas, going to different county police departments that are nicer, you know, pay more money. You know, that what you see in, in outside of Indian country around criminal justice is the same stuff that's happening in Indian country, but just on steroids, okay? It's just the delta is that much bigger. 
Anything you'd like to add? And the same thing with the nursing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's tough to retain, get nurses, let alone retain them. Uh, thank you for the uh, question, Chairwoman. Uh, well, when it comes to funding and uh, the contract, it allows for the uh, 638 to be uh, officers to be paid at the same level as a BIA police officer. For example, a BIA officer makes $20 an hour. Our officers should be making $20 an hour too. But when it comes to uh, funding distribution, our officers are given just enough money to possibly even make $13 an hour or 14 an hour while the BIA officers enjoy what uh, they're making right now. So what we're asking is that uh, the subcommittee uh, ask the BIA to fully fund their contract obligations when it comes to 638 contracts. And it is true that equipment is important. We need equipment out there in the rural areas where sedans will not cut it. We need four by fours and with the adequate equipment to cover the rural parts of the uh, uh, Navajo Nation as we speak right now. And like I said earlier, there was a, uh, four inches and five inches of wet snow. So therefore what happens after the snow melts, uh, a lot of muddy roads and we need police units that will cover those mighty roads in order to respond to emergency calls. So that's what we're asking. So equipment and salary is what we're asking, but at the same time to be treated just equally as what BIA officers are making through our 638 contract. Ms. Echohawk, I know how important it is to have the non-police be part of the, the solution mm -hmm. um, for, for everything from witnesses to survivor um, help to what you spoke to with children. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, um, particularly as we talk about, and you brought up SANE nurses, so sexual assault nurse examiners, and in my testimony, one of the things I shared was of a young woman, and this was in um, an area where she could have possibly accessed either an urban program or an IHS program, but neither of them on that weekend had a SANE nurse available, and so she was not comfortable going anywhere else, and so instead of getting that rape kit done, um, they said you can wait and not shower after being raped multiple times until Monday, or you can just take your shower now, which is what she did, and now any evidence of those rapes has been washed away. And so when we look at these services, it is integral. And one of the things when we look at particularly how VAWA dollars flow into the counties that are then dispersed across organizations are then used across the counties, they very often do not reach the organizations like the Seattle Indian Health Board and other tribal organizations. They're held in the county, and we also know that there is a direct no access to data because they're not gathering at those levels that say how many victims that they have that are American Indian Alaska Native. So I currently have an effort um, happening in King County, one of the largest counties in the country. I'm excited to say that we've partnered together and I am working with them to redo the way the county, um, the prosecutor's office collects data from victims of um, crime, particularly sexual assault and domestic violence. And I'm going to be training their officers and all of the prosecutors to do that differently. We're going to use that as a national toolkit that could be used across counties, across federal agencies, because we, we can't wait for somebody else to create the solution for us. And I'm very fortunate to be in King County and to have them working with me to do that. But I will say that I am doing this at night in my other office called Starbucks. Um, <laughs> and I would like at some point in time for somebody at the county levels, the state levels, the federal level to say, you know what, Native women are important. We're going to make sure that you get the funding that you need so you can have the resources that you need because my organization is going to create the national framework and you'll see it in about six months and we're just going to do it. We need the resources to do it well and I could do it faster if I had the resources. And that, that's the misclassification that yes. you're talking about. Yes, data misclassification. Yeah. Thank you so much for your testimony and um, thank you uh, both sir and Ms. Echohawk for, for serving people at, at times of crisis when that's the last thing they want to be doing is picking up the phone and making that phone call. Thank you. Thank you for your past work thank in that. You. Now you gotta run back to the office. I do. <laughs> and thank you all for coming back to work tonight. Oh, that's great. We're gonna have conversations about whether or not this format really works. And the, uh, the next panel, please join us. I have, I have two copies. Thank you. I pick them up wherever I go.
Thanks. I have one, and my aide has one, but thank you. Did you need a, did Janet want an extra copy? Or she left. We'll make sure. He doesn't want to carry it around. <laughs> that way. That's, that's okay, Tyler. You can go back and try to help see if we can accommodate. <coughs> Good morning. As I mentioned earlier, part of our edge uh, uh, who's going to close out this morning's panels, we're going to have a, a robust discussion on. Uh, Indian education in, in, in Indian country. And um, I know some people come in and out, and that's wonderful. So I'll just go over what we're doing with the timer again really quick. Um, please introduce yourself. That will not count against your time. You'll get your full five minutes. And um, at four minutes, a yellow light will come on. That lets you know you have, have about a, a minute to start wrapping up. Um, and then the red light comes on at five. Your full testimony will be entered into the committee records. We want to thank you for that. So don't feel rushed if you don't get to everything. As you can see, we're running a little late because we're, we're trying to ask really, really good questions. So um, we're going to, for um, the recorder, go in order of the table. So if you'd please start, sir. Good morning, honorable committee members. Um, Thank you for the opportunity. Is, to is the red light on on your? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here. Um, my <coughs> name is Louis Angaro. I'm a Muckleshoot Tribal Council member. Um, I have the privilege to serve as the chairman of our tribal school commission. Um, a little background on the school. Uh, the Muckleshoot Tribe is committed to the success of our children through culturally appropriate education. Um, to prepare our future generations for what is ahead. The Muckleshoot Tribal School is the first tribally controlled school to enter a compact with the BIE in the state of Washington. Uh, the tribal school provides a K through 12 instruction. It infuses uh, Muckleshoot cultural practices, the history and the language. Um, Muckleshoot leadership has uh, worked hard to meet the needs of our students through the adoption of the new exciting programs one of those programs is a language and cultural instruction program. It's uh, training our teachers through the Muckleshoot cultural experience and the traditional teaching styles, uh, creating bilingual signage and visual communication in every classroom, um, as well as morning drum circle, which uh, provides song and dance for the day. Um, nutrition programs, uh, which we integrate traditional foods and all of that. Um, Culture Night and the annual potlatch um, we have once a year. Uh, and uh, as well as we have the woodshop curriculum that we're um, bringing back into the school. So uh, that's, uh, it's about our sciences and our techniques and traditions through carving practices, tool making and technologies. Um, Why this, uh, while much of this work has been done to bring our ancestors' vision to fruition, we have a lot more work to do. With the subcommittee's assistance, we can continue improving the learning environment for our students. The tribe's request today stem from our experiences at the Muckleshoot Tribal School. During the planning phase for the Muckleshoot Tribal School, disagreement quickly emerged between the tribe and the BIE over the size and capacity of the school. Disregarding the tribe's student population projections at the time, the BIE constructed the tribal school to accommodate the student population as it was. As the tribe anticipated, the tribal school reached capacity shortly after the construction in 2009. 
Today, the school student population alone is 565, making it over capacity by nearly 100 students. That's not even counting the staff. The overcrowding at the tribal school reached the point where we were forced to hold classes in hallways and repurpose other spaces. As a result, the tribe and the BIA began working together to secure modular classrooms in order to accommodate the growing student population. Ultimately, the BIA's Division of Facility Management and Construction, DFMC, recommended six modular units, which would house 12 classrooms. During that time, the DFMC stated that anticipated the modular classrooms would be delivered in advance of the upcoming school year, which began in August of 2017. Unfortunately, the modular classrooms were not delivered on time, and the project was lingering. This led us to assume the role of general contractor in March of 2019. Even after doing so, we had trouble getting the DFMC to release the funds. Last spring, the Tribal Council raised the issue directly with you, Chairwoman McCollum. Uh, with the assistance of you and your staff, modular classrooms were delivered this week and are still being delivered. Um, we have three that are being set up as we speak today. While the tribe is forever grateful for your assistance, it should not be this difficult for us to provide a healthy learning environment for our students. The Muckleshoot Tribe urges the subcommittee to prioritize construction funding that so that Indian country children can obtain quality education in a safe environment. The tribe also requests the subcommittee to inquire about the organizational structure of the DFMC and how it deploys its funding provided by Congress. Finally, the tribe urges the subcommittee to provide funding for culturally relevant education programs. Since it's been implemented in 2016, the tribal school emphasis on incorporating culture into the education system has proven successful. This evidence is in rising graduation rates and our students' strong sense of identity and community. The BIE's Immersion Demonstration Grant program supports such efforts by providing funding for initiatives aimed at increasing language proficiency and protecting against indigenous language loss. The tribe urges the subcommittee to expand the funding to implement culturally appropriate teachings. So in conclusion, I really want to thank you all for your time and for <coughs> allowing me to come here and speak. Thank you. Mr. Lewis, good morning. Good morning. Chairperson McCollum, Ranking Members Joyce, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on education priorities in the fiscal year 2021 appropriations. My name is Stephen Rowe Lewis, and I'm governor of the Gila River Indian Community. Skuxiotic, good morning. I'm here to testify specifically on the Section 105L school construction and leaseback program that was piloted at the Gila River Indian Community last year. I'm joined today by Councilwoman Monica Anto, uh, Councilman Avery White, our youth council delegation from the, com from the community, uh, our Miss Gila River, Tyler Owens, and junior Miss Gila River, Susanna Osef. For years, this committee has been asked to address the school construction backlog that exists for BIE schools at the Department of the Interior, a backlog that would take approximately 60 years or three generations, three generations to clear at current funding levels. Even though this committee has increased funding wherever possible, incremental funding was insufficient to address the backlog. So you challenge the administration and tribal nations to bring you innovative solutions to the problem. Two years ago, I brought you a proposal from the Healer Indian community to pilot the first school construction leaseback in Indian country. And I have uh, two packets of actual photos of the finished Gila Crossing Community School. The proposal relied on existing statutory authority under Section 105L of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. Under the leaseback program, the community financed construction of the school and upon completion, leased the school back to the Department of the Interior through a negotiated lease. Utilizing this program and working with this committee to secure appropriations for the lease payment, the community was able to complete construction in a little over a year, 13 months, and under budget for less than the amount of the department would have spent to replace the school in the first place. Gila Crossing is truly the community school. 
The community's culture is evident in the school, curric in the school curriculum, and there are reminders of our Akimar Atham and Peeposh heritage everywhere you look. We are proud of this school, and even prouder that we were able to pilot a program that can be replicated throughout Indian Country. As with all pilot programs, it was a learning experience, and the community also took a great deal of risk. But together, the community, the administration, and you, the appropriators, ensured that this was a successful project. Based on our experience, we have a few recommendations to share. We recommend continued funding of the 105L lease program at the Department of the Interior. With the completion of the Gila Crossing Community School, we are first requesting continued funding to meet the annual lease payments for this school. In addition, for fiscal year 2021, we are proposing an additional $20 million for school construction under the 105L lease program. As indicated earlier, the need for new school construction in Indian Country is significant, as you've heard. At Gila River alone, we had three BIE schools in poor condition and overcrowded. It took decades to get the Blackwater Community School on the school replacement list to begin with. And even with the construction of Gila Crossing, the Casablanca Community School remains overcrowded and in poor condition. The additional $20 million in fiscal year 2021 would allow for another four or more schools to be constructed using the construction leaseback program. The community also supports the language in fiscal year 2020 appropriations, the report to explore mandatory funding for the 105L lease program. Mandatory funding would alleviate the need to reprogram the statutorily mandated funding from critical programs and staffing for tribal programs at the Department of Interior and the Indian Health Service. Mandatory funding is also supported by the National Congress of American Indians and was included in the Indian Country Budget Request to Congress for fiscal year 2021. Another key component to making this program even more successful is access to other federal financing tools, specifically new market tax credits. The lack of credits, the lack of credits designated to projects in Indian Country make it especially difficult to compete for new market tax credits, even though tribal access would save the federal government up to 20% on much needed infrastructure construction in Indian Country. We urge this committee and all of Congress to support tribal specific language in legislation that increases tribal access to new market tax credits. In conclusion, I'm honored to sit here today and share my community success story with you. Your commitment to Indian Country's self-determination is commendable and can serve as a model across Congress and the administration. We look forward to coming back with more success stories that can enhance this program and stand ready to assist this committee and other tribes across Indian Country as they explore the 105 L lease program. And as always, you are always welcome to the Gila River Indian community to see this wonderful school. Thank you so much. Masapo. Chairman McCullen, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of the National Indian Education Association. My name is Marita Hines. I'm from Tsuki Pueblo. I am the president of the NIE board. NIA is the most inclusive national organization advocating for cultural-based educational opportunities for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. Each day, our organization equips tribal leaders, educators, and advocates to prepare the over 650,000 Native students across the nation for success in the classroom and beyond. Native education is a bipartisan effort rooted in the federal trust responsibility to tribal nations and their citizens. NIA thanks the subcommittee for its ongoing commitment to fulfilling this constitutional responsibility by advancing Native education programs and services in fiscal year 2020. In particular, we appreciate the subcommittee's oversight of BIE programs and services for Native students. NIA urges you to continue your commitment to Native students by fully funding Native education within the BIE in fiscal year 2021 appropriations. I will highlight several of NIA's key appropriation priorities for fiscal year 2021. Bureau funded schools must be appropriated, must be appropriated $430 million for urgent school construction and repair. NIA appreciates recent steps to address immediate infrastructure needs in bureau-funded schools through increased school construction funding in fiscal year 2020. Despite, despite such strides forward, funding continues to fall short of the full need. 
In 2016, the Office of the Inspector General at the Department of the Interior found that it would cost $430 million to address immediate facility repairs in the BIE. In addition, that report estimated over $1.3 billion in overall need for education construction at BIE schools. By the end of FY fiscal year 2019, the maintenance backlog in bureau-funded schools had ballooned to over $727 million. Continued funding shortfalls for the high quality construction, repair, and maintenance of bureau funded schools have impacted my own community of Tsuki Pueblo. In addition to my role as the NIE president, I work at Tetsuki Winge School, a bureau funded school operated by my tribe. Our classrooms are bursting at the seams. The school has grown to over 55 students from when I began in 2012, and now we, ha which had 17 students. Despite several renovations to retrofit outdated wiring, heat, and air over the years, the electrical system regularly overloads a fuse when using even a printer or a shredder. Our school is 84 years old. Our classrooms share one IT maintenance technician with all tribal facilities, where our classrooms and our administration offices have problems with Wi-Fi and internet services. Even with these hardships, our phenomenal staff and educators have done amazing work to advance education for our students, and parents continue to send their children to our school because of their, the, the incredible progress that we have made over the past eight years. However, additional funding is critical to ensuring safe access to the facility and providing technology critical to a 21st century education. Sadly, our story is not unique. Though current funding levels fail to fully address the $727 million in immediate school need, the need for construction and repair in BIE schools is too great to wait for a possible infrastructure package without ongoing funding to address construction needs. Seven schools on the 2016 construction list have yet to receive funds for design and construction. Limited funding continues to hold up progress for schools such as Greasewood Springs Community School in Arizona where students and educators continue to face overcrowding and unsafe facilities. Native students deserve to learn a safe and healthy school where they can thrive. The Indian School Equalization Program, ISEP, should be fully funded at $431 million for fiscal year 2021. ISEP funds the core budget account for BIE elementary and secondary schools. Through this program, schools, and including my own school in Greasewood Springs, receive funding to pay salaries for teachers and other personnel. While ISEP is funded at approximately $2 million per school, each public school across the country receives, on an average, $7 million for infrastructure-related salaries, wages, and employee benefits. Each year, schools are forced to further stretch limited ISEP funds to fulfill regulations that require educators to be paid salaries comparable to those at the only other federal school system, the Department of Defense Education Activity, DODIA. This requirement is meant to support equality and access. However, federal appropriations have failed to account for increase in competitive salaries, both at DODIA and in states where BIE schools are located. Good teachers matter. Increased investment is required to ensure access to highly qualified, culturally competent educators at all schools. In addition, NIA supports requests to fully fund and support tribal colleges and universities through fiscal year 2020 recommendations provided the, by the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. Thank you very much. Mr. Kilmer. <clears throat> Thanks, Madam Chair. Governor Lewis, I liked your after photos better than your before photos, so <laughs> thank you for sharing those. Um, I, I'm not quite sure who to ask this to, but Councilman Ungaro, you talked about the um, fact that you know the day you opened your new school it was already at over capacity, and it drove this need to build portables. Um, is there something, I mean, obviously there's a systemic problem of underfunding, but is there another systemic problem that our subcommittee ought to be looking at to try to prevent that type of dynamic from occurring? Ideally, when you open a school, you, you're you not already over capacity. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I believe looking at the uh, enrollment as well, like our general enrollment of the, the tribe, 
a third of our tribe is under the age of 18. I mean, it's no mystery, the, the wave of kids that are coming and these schools and what we're doing to set our kids up for success through natural resources and create leadership um, in those kids to not only just set them up for success in Indian country, but success here in Washington, D.C. or wherever they want to go. The opportunity has been left up to us to create that. And what's not happening is the funding isn't coming through for us to be able to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah. And um, the challenges in Indian country for education is no mystery of what's going on here. I mean, we weren't set up for success all the way back from 1863. So um, just a little over 65 years ago, we won the Supreme Court case where our kids and people of color would be welcome into the classroom. So, you know, that's not very many generations ago. In the Indian country where I'm at, it's a, I'm the first generation graduate in my household, so high school graduate. So, you know, we don't have people to fall back on to help us navigate the state institutions through college and all of that stuff. But what we're setting up in these tribal schools is we're giving our kids a place in the classroom, a sense of identity, but as well as being able to teach them um, not just their own traditional ecological knowledge, but making them proud and giving them that spot in the classroom, but as well as being able to comprehend and understand the OSPI and the STEM curriculum and infusing that together, which makes them stronger and gives them the ability to make the choice if mm -hmm. they want to stay at home on the reservation or if they want to come and be your staffer someday. So that's what we're trying to do. Mr. Kilmer, we, this is a problem. Uh, the Beatrice Rafferty School in Maine was delayed um, for years because of a disagreement on population size because the BIE decided that it knew, and it was the BIA at the time, uh, knew what the enrollment was going to be and did not listen to the community and did not listen to the, did not listen to the parents. And um, Ms. Pingree and I and others found ourselves, uh, you know, listening carefully to the community and then questioning the decision making that was moving forward. And the tragedy about what's happened at, at this new school is the gym space, the cafeteria space, all the community spaces now have been built on a certain size population, which was too small. So even with the modulars being added, if, if you want to have an all school where um, younger children are, um, you know, uh, practicing uh, being in, in larger groups and performing or, or giving presentations, they can't get together or the, the older kids can't. I mean, you and I have been parents. My kids are much older than yours. I'm a grandmother now, but um, you, you know how schools work. And when, so when you undersize them, uh, you know, gymnasium space, community space, cafeteria space, uh, cultural areas all get impacted on this. And so I'm going to make a plea here before I turn this over to Mr. Joyce. The census is coming up. And I had some young Johnson O'Malley students from St. Paul, Minnesota schools in my office. And I was telling those students, you need to, when you see that census form come in and you hear about the census, you've got to get excited about it. And you've got to get the head of household, your elder, your parents, or whoever it is. You need to get them to do an accurate census. And you need to identify in the census Native Americans. Because formulas will be based on that. And um, you know, if, if it's not right and then you add 10 years into the future, a lot of decisions facing Indian country and for how Mr. Joyce and I go back and allocate for top line funding at the 302B account, census is something everybody's looking at. So, and there's also some good paying census jobs out there if I can make a plug for that too because we, we need to hire more people. But the census is really important. I know Indian country is working on it, but we can't spread the word enough about how important the census is going to be. So thank you for letting me tag on to your, your question because it's, it's a good one and it's been a frustrating one for this committee for a while. So excellent question, Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. Um, certainly appreciate Chairman Lewis, your invitations to come on out. Uh, in I know that time's getting later and we're already behind, but I was wondering if you could explain your frustration with the new market tax credit and, and your inability to to secure it for the Indian tribes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the, of the committee. Uh, uh, 
Congressman Joyce. Uh, for, for the new market tax credits, access is limited to Indian country. We're working with uh, NAFOA, the uh, Native American Finance Officers Association, and the Ways and Means, uh, because when we were working on financing uh, the 105L lease and, and the, the, the design build, the allocation cycle, the construction cycle, and the appropriations were out of sync while we were building this, you know, we, we built this school and designed it within 13 months. And so all of those moving parts just weren't in sync for us uh, to, to be able to take advantage of the new market tax credits. Do you think a legislative fix is necessary? Definitely. Uh, for, for tribes, and this is, this is uh, a, a policy issue among all issues uh, having to do with, with tribal exactly. nations. Uh, tribal nations, uh, the, you know, for, for policy, tribal nations need to have specific language that includes tribes and not excludes them. Uh, and, and the new market tax credits is, is no exception. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to um, uh, say congratulations on getting your modulars delivered. How serendipity that it happened at the same time that you're testifying in front of the committee, but we'll take it. <laughs> um, but we're, uh, we're putting together an infrastructure bill, and I know that what we're looking at is green. Um, we're looking at technology, and this is infrastructure, and many of us are, our voices are at the table to make sure Indian countries included in that. So um, uh, s stay tuned. Um, and it needs to have an infusion of spending in it that's really going to be impactful and, and make a difference. So, um, uh, uh, Mr. Um, DeFazio is kind of taking the lead on that, uh, but we are doing some things in consultation through our staff, and I know Indian Country is, is, is at the table as that's moving forward. But that'll include schools, roads, bridges, um, broadband, all the things that come together to make a school successful. As, as you pointed out. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for your time here, and we'll have the next panel come up. <coughs> Thank you. And as the next panel comes up, I know a couple people saw me dashing out of the room. We were accommodating uh, later on this afternoon with two people who are willing to switch on testimony so someone can make an earlier flight to get home. So. We've got two people that are switching. Tyler knows who they are. Yes, and then we flight. also um, switching Mr. Allen's going last. Okay. So we'll update over the lunch break. Yeah, that's fine. This is like, you know, because the weather's going to get funky tonight. We want to make sure people get their flights. Got a little bit of a traffic jam, but that's a good thing to have. That means that there's a lot of people here participating. So really quickly, um, please introduce yourself and then start into your testimony. The time that you use to introduce yourself would not count against your time. You have five minutes. We have your testimony in the record. Uh, so we have all of it, so don't worry about getting through uh, everything. There's a lot to cover, and uh, the staff and I will be reading through it and using it to formulate questions and responses uh, to your concerns. So if you would please uh, start off. When you see the yellow light, there's a minute left. Um, then I'll go on the timer right here. There's a little red button. Make sure it's lit up on your mic before you start. And if you'd uh, lead us off, please. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. My name is Angelisa Begay, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the Zithlao Dili Community School. Okay. It's on. Oh, the red light? Okay, all right. Okay, so the Zithlao Dili Community School would like to thank the 
the subcommittee for your efforts, your support, and your dedication in prioritizing the appropriations and oversight for school repair and construction throughout the Bureau of Indian Education school system. With that, we are one of the schools from the 2016 school replacement list to receive funding for school replacement construction. Thus far, we have completed the planning phase and 20% schematic design phase. We are currently in the design build phase of the construction project. This whole process that we have taken has taken us much time and effort so, you know, as to reach this milestone. Our students, parents, and staff are excited with the new school that's coming up, and we've been working diligently and promptly in putting our new school into operation. The efforts we have set forth are for the well-being of our students and, and providing them with an adequate learning environment. Of course, it, it requires a team effort, and we've had to establish a positive relationship and a partnership with the BIE and the Indian Affairs Division of Facility Management and Construction so that we will be able to be successful in this for the school, the federal gov government, and of course for our students. Okay, this which brings us to our written testimony which you guys have a copy of. And in our written testimony we have outlined some concerns we have been experiencing through this process. At one of our meetings this week, we with we met with the Office of Facility Property and Safety Management, which oversees the division the Division of Facility Management and Construction. We had the opportunity to bring to light with them and to discuss some of these issues, which we hope will be taken into consideration. We believe we believe the with the path moving forward that we have a clear and transparent line of communication that were consistent with timelines and deadlines and alleviating unnecessary delays, which is imperative to our success in completing this project. As our partner, we asked the subcommittee to emphasize and reinforce the, important, the importance of clear and timely expectations, and also to continue oversight of this project and to keep in contact with the Death Island Dithley Community School the Office of Facility Property and Safety Management and the Division of Facility Management and Construction on the progress of our school replacement project and all those that were on the 2016 replacement list. In closing, the Jethlal Dithi Community School thanks the subcommittee for the important funding increases and oversight directed to school repair and replacement construction. Consistent funding is needed to complete these constructions on the 2016 replacement list, which directly impacts our children's future. In FY 2021, we ask you to continue these funding levels. We believe all children should be given the opportunity to reach their potential and go to school in safe buildings. Thank you for remaining our steadfast partners in this critical endeavor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, and members of this um, Appropriations Committee. I appreciate the time to share with you. I am coming from the Navajo Nation. I speak on behalf of nine Bureau-funded schools that are operated as tribally controlled schools. The executive board from these nine schools and the administration are committed to providing the best educational services for the children in our communities. We want to make sure that we continue to receive funding to operate instructional classrooms, residential programs, facility programs, transportation programs. Our technology is so crucial in providing the learning process to our young people for our business offices to make sure that our funding is always accounted for. We wanna make sure that's always taken care of. We wanna make sure that our administration and the school board remain on par, par in meeting the needs of these young people. While we're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, there are some challenges our schools experience. One of concern is that we're seeing an increase and the number of suicide ideations of our young people. To meet their needs, 
we have to make sure we get them the proper professional people, which means I have to find funding to pay specialized counselors. We also end up providing support services, although we are teaching, we'll take the time out to make sure we provide these young people the kind of support they need. So we really need to pay attention to the monies that come in to pay the personnel cost. We, we are already stretched with the ISEP funding that we get, but we wanna make sure we continue to meet costs. So we want you to help us in paying attention and the BIE teacher pay parity. The law requires that teachers and counselors in BIE school system are paid at the same rate as their counterparts in the overseas Department of Defense school system. For some reason, our administration did not request for those fundings. We did meet with them. We did make it a point to mention to them that we need their help in making sure that they request for these fixed costs to account for the 25 USC subsection 220. They could use that as an authorizing status and requesting for this fixed cost. So we ask for your support in making sure that we get that because we do need the monies in operating schools. The other latest concern that we're experiencing is on the reservation, we are spread into New Mexico. New Mexico has um, provided their teacher, state teachers, a 10% increase. Arizona has spread 20% over three years, which is making it really tough to maintain our teaching staff. We have excellent teachers. We've done very creative, innovative, professional development to keep our teachers on our campuses. We're gonna need help there. Another area that will help our schools ISEP funding is if we don't have to pay so much for the insurance. We do have challenges in making sure that our staff is provided cellular benefits. Right now, a great deal of our funding goes there. But if we could get assistance and helping to make sure that a tribally controlled school would have the same um, access to federal employee health benefits programs, and the federal employee group life insurance would be of a great assistance. It would not cost the government anything, but it would help us at least maintain some of the monies that we now spent, at least 50% of the monies we spent, stay within the school pots for our children to have access to those monies. The other one is our native language programs is having a big impact. I'm so happy that our teachers are now teaching the Diné language for, to our children. They are speaking. They are now hearing the language. I see that there's more confidence in them. It must continue to be funded. I can't say enough as to how well that program has changed our children. Thank you. I appreciate your hard work. You've got us supporting you, so keep doing what you guys are doing. Yeah. I am Beverly, co-host, recent past president of the Reno Navajo School Board Incorporated, and also secretary treasurer at this current time. And the Reno Navajo School Board Incorporated operates the Pine Hill Schools and other community services in West Central New Mexico. And I concur with the statements made by my colleagues at this table because it also reflects the needs that we have in the Rayma Navajo community, and particularly the Federal Employee Health Benefit Initiative. With 50 years, 50 years of institutional history at this first institution where we took over community control and self-determination. The Rayma School Board has developed unique capacity to administer its own program and true to its founding measure to educate the community people. The Rayma 
community people have come a long ways along the road of self-determination and establishing capacity and the ability to educate its people. This month, we celebrate our golden anniversary and thank you in large part to the early partnership establishment between the U.S. Congress and the Raymond Navajo School Board. Our founders came here, talked to your predecessors in 1970, and ever since we have been operating our own. Thank you immensely also on behalf of our constituents who are very thankful for the funds that were made available recently. These funds were the for improvement to the HVAC system, also to the renovation of the existing school buildings, also the building of a new gymnasium. And students are fortunate for the opportunity that they will be learning in an environment that is conducive to learning. But to fully realize the potential of operating in new refurbished buildings, the infrastructures have to be undergoing major rehabilitation and upgrading. For example, the water system, sewer and waste system, electrical system, gas system, roads on campus, broadband and improve IT systems. Right now, the infrastructure is life-threatening. There's constant water crises causing the school to shut down every now and then. And this causes a great deal of interruption. And we hope when we get new funds that it would help us to conduct comprehensive hydrology study to assess the water availability and the water table. Also secure the service of qualified engineers to conduct preliminary scope of work, repair and or replace the wells, rehabilitate the water treatment plant, including upgrading, replacing control systems, install water tower storage at perhaps 500,000 uh, gallon capacity on campus, which we don't have at this time replace the water main throughout the campus, initiate and maintain water testing so that we're in compliance with EPA standards and regulations. And the roads would be repaved because a lot of the infrastructure are underneath the pavement. Also, security cameras will be upgraded the operation of the facility management will be enhanced. As it is, we only receive 51% of funds for facility management. And we get a little bit from ISEP, but then if we get additional funds, there we would be comp complementing the ISEP funds. Also, the patchy, unreliable internet system will be improved to serve as the lifeline for not only the schools, but the medical clinic that we operate there on campus. There's still a way to go on the road to self-determination. The best way to do this is to stay the course, continue to make progress by working with one another, tribal, federal, and state partners. We wholeheartedly appreciate the bipartisan support and partnership and we work while we work to provide a safe and promising future for our students. Thank you very much. Hiani Washday, good morning. Um, Chairman McCollin, Ranking Members, Joyce, and the Honorable Committee of the sub Subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Ogallal Lakota Nation Education Consortium, which represents the Ogallal Sioux Tribe Authorized Grant School. I serve as the superintendent of one of these schools, Little Wound School District, 
uh, in South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. My testimony today focuses on the challenges our tribal grant schools face as a result of underfunding uh, within the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education. <clears throat> today, the primary means of the support is the Indian School Equalization Program, also known as ICEP, provides per pupil allocation to the Bureau of Indian Education grant schools for general operations expenditures. These funds, according to the Bureau's own documentation, are designed for educational related programming such as staff salaries and benefits, classroom supplies, textbooks, gifted and talented programs, and extracurricular activities. Unfortunately, funding is not sufficient to operate our schools. So today, um, I really want to paint a picture for you as a active school superintendent in a tribal grant school and just give you some key um, financial um, challenges we face with uh, today's current BIE, BIA policies and the application of attaining wild qualified teachers and uh, operating within our means. And so I, I may skip around a little bit, but I'll try and touch on, on the main points. Um, one reason why is that our federally funded programs like transportation, food service, special education and facilities are themselves underfunded and ICEP dollars must be used to plug in these budget holes. So we're constantly pulling ICEP dollars that were intended for education for school operations. So that's a huge challenge across the board. The other thing is facilities. Uh, BIA facilities operation and maintenance program is a primary example since 1981. Our school has only received full O&M funding once and between 2000 and 2016 our school received five million less in facilities funding that's needed. So if you look at chart A, it gives kind of a 16 year account of our O&M funding. So generally I think last year we received about a million dollars for O&M funding. But if you calculate that figure um, of needs for O&M funding, our school has missed out on, on about five million dollars of facility O&M funding over the last 16 years. Um, at Little Wound School, our elementary school building is 75 years old. Our middle school is 40 years old. Um, it's a tin building. They're both very dilapidated schools. Uh, we recently had a uh, energy efficiency study conducted by BIA in 2010, um, which described a five to eight million dollar repair uh, that still hasn't been funded and so we still are paying uh, high um, energy efficiency costs to, to operate our school. The other uh, key point that I want to touch on today is FEHB benefits. One of the biggest critical factors for Little Wound School is uh, we currently have a health plan where we pay um, individual coverage at about $900 a month per staff member. Mm -hmm. If we qualify for FEHB benefits, uh, that would reduce that cost to the school to about $425 a month. Mm -hmm. So Little Wound School operates about on $13 million a year. Um, this change would save us $1.4 million annually. If we uh, receive this change, we'd be able to utilize those funds to support education. And so I think that's a quick fix um, that, that you guys have already um, taken steps towards. I think it's a bi bipartisan agreement that would help all the tribal grant schools across the country. Um, in conclusion, you know, as we move forward, um, I, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, the Rama School was the first local controlled tribal grant school the second school was Loneman School on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And so over the course of the last 45, 50 years, um, our tribes have had local control. But if you look at the way uh, policies have been applied, historically, tribal grant schools are falling uh, further and further away from um, fully being funded. And I'm hoping that my testimony today will support uh, the appropriations as we move into the 21st century and help support uh, the children of the Ogallosu tribe in their future. 
Thank you. Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for coming here today and providing your testimony. It uh, is well received. I think uh, certainly as Madam Chair, being a former school teacher herself, anything that has to do with education, she's certainly behind in whatever she wants to do. I'm certainly in behind as well. Mm -hmm. I come from a long line of teachers, my grandmother, my my knee, and my aunts, my sister, my uh, now my cousins. So I appreciate the, the hard work that goes into educating people. And it's much more than just a school. It's, it's a requires a, a truly an educational community to make it happen. So we gotta make sure that we provide for you. Thank you. Um, we're going to look into what's going on um, with the school replacement that uh, you talked about for the DCSG um, school district. So the Division of Facilities Management and Construction, I've been passing notes because I've been trying, I've been oh. trying to get the question up here good. As located in the Bureau of Indian, it's, you're in Albuquerque. Yeah, that, that's the region you've been dealing with, or yes. have you been dealing with the DC office and no, it hasn't been gone well? The Albuquerque office. So just the Albuquerque yeah. office. Mm -hmm. We're gonna, do you know from talking to other colleagues in, in Indian country if they've, if they've experienced um, in other parts of the United States and other regions some of the, the challenges is that you've had like all of a sudden you're moving forward and there's no consultation and you feel like the rug's been pulled out from underneath your feet because now you have to do a sewer lagoon. Yeah, well, um, when I was here earlier listening to other, some of the other schools, they did mention the, some of the same problems and did bring to light that DFMC was kind of doing the same thing okay. to them as well, that's but good. in their region. That's good yeah. for us to know because mm -hmm. what, what I love about having the tribal public witness before we have the agencies here is you give us the questions to ask and to do follow-up, so mm -hmm. thank you. I think you probably, everybody's testimony is a little different, right. and so you kind of put the bright red light on top of that. So th thank you for that. Yeah. The insurance, I was, um, pa as I said, I was passing notes, no disrespect, but um, there is a bill, it's uh, HR um, 8595, it was introduced um, and it dealt with uh, the insurance um, issue that you've all brought up, which is very enlightening to me and um, something that you've done an excellent job of highlighting how we can save dollars so you can put them back into serving students. Um, it was um, on uh, January 15th, it was ordered to be reported by unanimous consent out of natural resources. So I'm gonna follow up and see what other committees that has to go through and I will talk to our leadership about that, and if it came out of unanimous consent, maybe you can talk to Mr. McCarthy as I'm talking to Mr. Hoyer, and maybe see if we can get this um, on the floor, because uh, that 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 would be great. Or if there's a holdup, find out what it what it is, so maybe we can work together and fix it. Um, the infrastructure package that I was talking about earlier, you know, looking at the whole school, you. You know, you, you move a school, you have to move pipes. You don't wanna just move the pipes in the school and get them up to, to good standards. It's every, everything that makes the connection, right? right? So I think you did an excellent job of highlighting that. And then I'm gonna have to look into, we, um, after um, the school shootings mm -hmm. that took place, and we had one um, on one of our Indian reservations in Minnesota um, uh, several years ago. Um, we went in and, and put in some, some safety features, and I'm hearing you talk about safety features, and uh, as a superintendent, you're nodding your head yes. Um, I, I want to, I'm gonna figure out what that safe school grant looks like, and I quite honestly, I don't know whether or not that those are grants you're available for. Do you know if you're available for the safe school grants, sir? I think we, we, we have, we, we may be available for it, I know we've had conversations with, with BIA and BIE in terms of you know, possibly um, filing for a DOJ that would provide a SRO in tribal grant schools. Um, but the safe school grant, um, I, I'm sure we're available for it. It's, it's just a matter of applying for it. But there are some ca capacity measures that could, could uh, support school safety at okay. the federal level. So there's other th other issues we can look at too, but we don't wanna make this so complicated that you always have to be hiring a grant writer or taking time away from your other duties to write grants. So 
We want to try to work together with you to make this as seamless as possible. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, you've got, I've got some homework. Yeah. You did Thank a good you. job as educators. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Will the next panel please come up? panel comes up, I want to uh, thank you for your, your patience. You've waited 45 minutes extra to testify, um, but it's so rare we get the opportunity to, to uh, I've got a big clock I'm trying to watch, <laughs> but we also want to hear uh, from your, your colleagues. So thank you for your patience with, with the committee. And are you familiar with how um, how the testimony is going to work, or would you like me to go over that again? Go over it again. Okay, happy to do that. So I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. Um, that will not count against your time. You will have five minutes. Uh, th that just makes things will go a little faster if we don't do double introductions. And when you see the yellow light, you have one minute left. Uh, when the light goes red, we ask you to conclude your testimony. All your testimony will be submitted into the committee record here. So we thank you for all of it, and please don't feel rushed. And we will be, um, Mr. Drayson will ask a few questions when we're done. But let's get started. So Ms. Billy, will you lead us off? Did I turn it on? Red light means yeah. Yeah, uh, My name is Carrie Billy. I'm the president and CEO of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, which is this nation's 37 tribal colleges. Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, thank you for your tremendous past support of tribal higher education and for your faith in the power of place-based, culturally grounded education and workforce development. They surely are the means for bridging the swirl of generational poverty and all that flows from that oppressive river. Our tribal college requests are described in our written testimony, so I will not mention all of them. Briefly, we are close to full operating funding. We only need about $8 million to fill, fully fund the 30 Tribal College Act institutions and a total of about $17 million in new support to fully fund all tribal colleges. We also ask for your help in meeting TCU construction and rehabilitation needs, beginning first with a study of tribal college facilities that was mandated but never done over more than four decades ago. Today, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, but let's not make this a once in a year event. We invite you to visit any of the tribal colleges, in fact, all of them, anytime, so you can see and experience the impact of your annual investment in our nation's 37 tribal colleges. The return on that investment between six and $17 for every one federal dollar is visible every day at the tribal colleges in their communities. At Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, you'll meet pre-engineering student Bobby Thomas. As SIPI student government president, Bobby can tell you how in just a few short years, SIPI tripled its completion rate while growing its enrollment by 25%. You'll see 100 graduating students who already have jobs as optical and computer technicians, chefs, natural resource managers, early childhood educators, and more. At Navajo Technical Institute, University in Crown Point, New Mexico, you'll meet Leslie Nota and Erica Bagodi, students enrolled in one of two ABED accredited engineering programs and advanced manufacturing programs where they use state-of-the-art 3D printers to make parts for Boeing, Honeywell, and Lockheed Martin. You'll see those same students in their spare time using those same printers to make tiny little customized braces for res cats and dogs with broken limbs. Leslie even reversed engineered parts for his old car to get to class every day, and Erica designed a now patented solar medical cooler and a 3D print finger for her off-the-grid elderly family members with diabetes. At Salish Kootenai College in Pablo, Montana, you'll see high school students spending their afternoon at SKC's Innovative STEM Academy, working with college professors, engaging in community-relevant experimental, experimental learning, and completing high school already on a direct pathway to college. At Sitting Bull College in Fort Yates, North Dakota, you'll visit their Lakota immersion nest and meet two and three-year-olds speaking only Lakota, part of the generation that will save their ancestors' language. 
At Red Lake Nation College in Minnesota, you'll meet high school senior Emma Kingbird, who through Red Lake's early college program has now already earned more than half the credits she needs for an associate degree, and she's also completed basic training to join the U.S. Army. At Turtle Mountain Community College in Belcourt, North Dakota, you'll learn that when the college was established in the early 1970s, you could count, on, you could count the number of Ojibwe teachers on three fingers. Today, you'll meet Billy Howell, a Turtle Mountain grad and one of 280 or so native teachers on or near the reservation. Currently, more than 90% of the reservations, reservation area teachers are native thanks to Turtle Mountain's elementary education and secondary science programs. That's the transformative power of tribal colleges, and you are responsible. I could go on, but you get the idea. Success story after success story, native teachers, native scientists, native leaders, native nation builders. The future of our America is there at the 37 tribal colleges. Come and see it and be part of this native renaissance. We are so close to full funding of the tribal college and universities assistance acts. We only need and ask for additional eight to seven million dollars. I know it's really difficult. Um, but in closing, we have one great need, 21st century technology-enabled facilities that TCUs need to help our tribes fully rebuild our nations. When Congress enacted the Tribal College Act 41 years ago, it directed Interior to conduct a study of TCU facilities and authorized a construction program. 41 years later, the study has not been completed and the construction program was never funded. We asked the subcommittee to direct the department to, do the, to complete the study and fund a tribal college construction program. Our tribes cannot be competitive in the 21st century without the ability to train a 21st century workforce. Let's end generational poverty in, this, in Indian country. Thank you so much for all you do and let's work together to create a native renaissance. Thank you. My intro is like five minutes. Ani nui de kewad, ogbe wa se kwe indigena kaz ga saga squa, jime kag and dunjwa, nimin wain dun, wabamunin, ingai go, jine dajin dun, ginin wain win and an ningum. Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Laurie Harper. I'm from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe in present day northern Minnesota. My whole life has been steeped in educational equity of our people. I currently serve as the Director of Education for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I'm the elected chair of the Buganagizhik School Board, and I'm also president of the Tribal Education Department's National Assembly. The Leech Lake Band is one of the 11 tribal nations in Minnesota. TEDNA is a national nonprofit membership organization for the Education Departments of American Indian and Alaska Native Tribes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today for funding for TEDS. First and foremost, our sincerest gratitude for appropriating funds for the past six fiscal years to support TEDS through the Department of the Interior's Title 25, Section 2020 grants. This subcommittee clearly values the crucial role of TEDS in providing supporting and coordinating educating education programs and services to Native American students. TEDS are making historical progress in defining educational programs and services, a role that federal education policy ignored for too long and Congress has sought to change. Continued funding is required to maintain and expand essential and successful work of TEDS for our Native American students, particularly those served by the Bureau of Indian Education funded schools. For this, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and TEDNA respectfully request $10 million to support TEDS in the Department of Interior Environment and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2021. The funding for TEDS through the Department of Interior is authorized in the 25 USC Section 2020, and this authorization dates back to 1988. Since its enactment, Congress has retained this important authorization in every major reauthorization of federal education laws. However, the authorization remained unfunded for more than 25 years. Outstandingly, due to commitment of this subcommittee, <coughs> Section 2020 grants finally received funding in fiscal year 2015. There are currently 11 Section 2020 TED grantees whose vital work and initiatives under these grants have only just started. They and many other TEDs need continued and increased Section 2020 funding. For some Native American students, the 183 BIE funded schools remain the only educational option because of the unavailability or unsuitability of state public schools for geographic or other reasons. 
Tribes operate most BIE-funded schools through contracts or grants. A few remain directly operated by the BIE. All BIE-funded schools are and historically have been drastically underfunded, as this subcommittee is well aware. <clears throat> as the GAO stated, funding factors seriously harm Native American students and hinder their academic success. The BIE-funded schools and the students they serve are most in need of the assistance of tribal ed departments. This is exactly what Section 2020 grants are intended to address. A crucial area that Congress identified for Section 2020 grants is the development of tribal education codes, including tribal education policies and tribal standards applicable to curriculum personnel, students, facilities, and support programs. Given this congressional intent and mandate, I would like to speak to my own experience as a tribal education director. Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Tribal Education Department houses multiple programs. Within those programs, the we have, sorry, the Leech Lake TED in Minnesota serves students attending 10, K, 10 state K through 12 public schools as well as the Buganagizik School, a tribally controlled school funded through the BIE. In prioritizing capacity building and crafting our education policy, we have actively sought the input of our community, including our students, parents, and caregivers in how they identify and define success in a school educational setting. The Leech Lake Tribal Education Department is fluid. We are striving to build <coughs> the capacity of our current staff and at the same time identifying areas within the TED that needs to be built up. This has been a multi-pronged approach to policy and capacity building. This includes data gathering of our post-secondary students and what areas they are graduating in, working with the tribal workforce development to identify current and future workforce needs and coordinating the Minnesota Family Investment Program to ensure family financial stability so our students and families can focus on education. Our Section 2020 grant funds an essential component of building our capacity. In order to meet our student needs, we are using the Section 2020 funding to develop the Tribal Education Code and a comprehensive ed plan that will be culturally specific and relevant to us as Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. The activities funded by the Section 2020 grant has assisted us in strengthening our relationships with outside entities and it's impacted the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe's involvement in areas beyond the grant. Our approach to su supporting students emotionally, culturally, physically, and mentally will foster our students' success in any educational setting. The Section 2020 grantees are just beginning to demonstrate the positive impacts we have in Native America education. We want to continue our important work and build upon our successes. Increased funding will help us do that. Section 2020 grants help facilitate local tribal control of education through supporting early education initiatives and development of culturally re relevant curriculum and assessments, increasing tribal participation through TEDs, providing coordination, administrative support services, technical assistance to schools and education programs, including maintaining and sharing electronic data regarding Native American students and develop and enforce tribal education codes, including tribal educational policies and tribal standards applicable to curriculum, personnel, students, facilities, and support programs. As Congress has recognized, these are core educational governance functions that are most appropriately left to the local government closest to the students being served, the tribes. Section 2020 grants clearly help facilitate this local control. While TEDNA recognizes this subcommittee's longstanding commitment to funding TEDs, we would like to point out that we view a $10 million authorization as the bare minimum required to fulfill the intent of funding the important work of TEDs in Native American education. Further, while Section 2020 funding goes directly to TEDs, TEDNA working closely with the BIE continues to play an important role in providing technical assistance to TEDs. TEDNA's role is one that the subcommittee understands and has long acknowledged. We respectfully request that this be memorialized in the report issued by the subcommittee. The continued investment in TEDs is sound federal policy. It efficiently focuses and maximizes scarce resources for historically underserved populations. It encourages and supports local control and tribal self-determination in education. The sub subcommittee has an exceptional opportunity to further these goals and help generations of Native American students. We respectfully request $10 million for the TEDs and the Department of the Interior, Environment, and Related Agency Appropriation Bill for fiscal year 2021 to continue the groundbreaking, challenging, and most beneficial work being done through the Section 2020 grants. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. My name is Lawrence Mirabal, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present testimony on behalf of the college. IAIA was established in 1962 as the only BIA boarding school teaching native arts and culture. In 1986, IAIA became an independent college chartered by the United States Congress to empower creativity and leadership in native arts and culture. First and foremost, IAIA is a community, a community that embraces the past, enriches the present, and creates the future while provoking thought and providing exceptional educational opportunities. Our college is one of only three higher ed institutions in the nation chartered directly by the Congress. The Institute of American Indian Arts is a national treasure and is where contemporary native art was born. IAIA offers <laughs> bachelor's programs in studio arts, cinematic arts and technology, creative writing, museum studies, indigenous liberal studies, and the performing arts, as well as a graduate degree in creative writing. Additionally, the college is very close to establishing a second graduate program in studio arts. The college serves more than 500 students representing 34 states and 93 tribes from across North America. Over 80% of IAIA students are Pell eligible, and many are first generation attendees. These numbers translate into dreams fulfilled, new opportunities, and a generational shift for native students and the communities that they come from. The impact and importance of the work being done at IAIA are undeniable. To ensure financial sustainability, the college continues to vigorously pursue revenue sources to augment its congressional funding. Evidence of this can be found in the college's operating budget. As of the most recent fiscal year, almost 30% of the budget came from non-appropriation sources. The students, faculty, and staff of IAIA are deeply appreciative of this subcommittee's strong record of support. It is clear that the unique mission of the college is understood and valued by the members of this body. The college's 2021 budget request includes a modest increase of $252,000 over the amount enacted in fiscal year 2020. The fiscal year 2021 budget funding request will assist IAIA in addressing several key priorities. Like many institutions around the country, the college is placing a renewed focus on student safety. The college's community is diverse and dedicated to providing an environment for learning, living, and working that's free from discrimination, harassment, misconduct, and retaliation. To ensure continuous improvement in this area, the college has established the position of Coordinator of Title IX Equity and Inclusion and will soon make a permanent hire to fill this role. IAIA will soon embark on the creation of a Native Arts Research Center on the college's campus. This project will be partially funded by the college's partnership with the Mellon Foundation, with the college eventually absorbing ongoing operational costs. The research center will coordinate resources at the college and scholarly fellowships to support research about contemporary Native American and Alaskan Native arts. It is anticipated that the research center will serve as a world-class destination for scholars throughout the country. Offering a competitive benefits package is essential for recruiting and retaining the most talented employees. The college continues to absorb cost increases associated with health insurance, maintaining an equitable faculty rank and step schedule, and providing staff with competitive wages. However, rising costs in these areas continue to be a reality that the college must deal with. In summary, IAIA's top priority is ensuring the success of our students, affording them the opportunity to achieve greatness and give back to their communities. This is how generational change is made, and IAIA is very honored to be a key part of that process. To continue this important work, we respectfully request that the subcommittee act again in fiscal year 2021, as you did in fiscal year 2020, by supporting the administration's request of $10.71 million in the independent agency's title of your bill. The students, faculty, and staff of IAIA greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. Madam Chair and Ranking Member Joyce, I um, got to meet you yesterday, and I, I'm really happy you went to NCAI, and um, you know, we'll work with you, Madam Chair, for many years. I'm Ryan Wilson, the president of the National Alliance to Save Native Languages. 
I'm also the co-chair of the National Congress of American Indians Native Language Task Force and former president of National Indian Education Association and 20 years on their board. Um, so we've kind of been doing this a while. I also want to acknowledge one of our founding board members of the National Alliance and my also uh, co-chair of NCAI Task Force, um, my, my brother Joe Garcia, former president of NCAI. He came to uh, support us and later, later on in my five minutes, Perhaps, Madam Chair, with your permission, you know, he can introduce himself as well. I'll talk fast and brevity is not our strength, but we're going to show some today, you know, and uh, we saved good. the best for last. And yeah. there goes Mr. Garcia. So go ahead. Good, good. Um, you know, and I want to thank your staff. Janet Erickson's been working on this language issue for 20 some years up here. Um, the uh, prodigious record of Darren Benjamin and um, his uh, uh, belongs in the pantheon on this issue as well and um, I appreciate his uh, presence here he's got a lot of patience as well we've got a very simple ask you've got a program that people are talking about um, throughout Indian country it's um it's created a wonderful buzz and if you think of our languages as kind of like a sleeping giant you know they're getting up on one knee now and really trying to rise and be a part of um, what culturally based education should be and what we're asking you is to once again in this appropriations budget codify this immersion program in it. And I asked for uh, four million in the testimony. I just want to get in step with NIEA because I just read their testimony, which was five million. And I want to, um, you know, I, I know we start saying a million here and there. Pretty soon we're talking about real money, but um, we have uh, a chance here to do something really dynamic. And this started five years ago. Um, you guys offered um, supportive report language that encouraged the Bureau to look into this. Eventually that turned into, um, you know, some initial funding for the projects and now we've got a chance. We've had 30 schools receive this money over the last two fiscal years. And, and the, the main primary point I want to make is the Bureau is uh, funding these schools on one-year grants and that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, what I would like to see is that you go ahead and authorize them on at least a five-year uh, cycle on this. And the reason for this is simple. You would never say to a BIE school, we're only gonna fund your math department one year. Um, how would you get good personnel? How would you get traction? How would you have a stable leadership you know, within that department? What we're really looking at is for these schools to create and engender in their culture, or their site-based management, these language efforts that are gonna be impactful, dynamic, and solvent and lasting. And that can't happen by just one grant this year. Next year, you're out of the loop. Someone else is going to get it. And it's really disrespectful to the last remaining language speakers that we have because they're making commitments to go to these schools and teach and be there without even knowing if they're going to be hired, you know, the next year and so forth. So I wanted to bring that forward to your attention. And I, um, I, I, uh, I want to also say because Nigani's here and you're from where you're from, Madam Chair, this... This, they precipitated this effort. When the Bugganagishik school hosted Nigani, they wouldn't count them towards their ICEP student count, the immersion students there. And so they were having a school within a school, but without getting any benefit of those students on the student count numbers. And when we talked to the Bureau about it, they're like, well, that's just how it is. There's no statutory authority or whatever. And we go, yeah, there is. And, and, and these BIE schools have had the authority for many years to teach languages, but the um, budget constraints and um, really the profound sense of urgency to fund their primary core academic areas superseded that. So what we wanted was a complete separate set aside that wouldn't be commingled with ICIP dollars or with their operating budgets for immersion so that those schools would have a chance to have traction, to have solvency and to be able to exist in our um, kind of ever changing world. And, and I, um, I want to impress that point. There's a difference between teaching Indian for a classroom, an hour long um, class, and then another group of 30 students comes in and all that versus using the medium, using the language as a medium of instruction and having an immersion program in your school. And this is what we're asking you to really clarify in your report language and also this, um, that we authorize them for multi-year grants. Now, I'm going to just tell you a quick story, and if it's okay with you, I just wanted my brother to be able to introduce himself because he's older than me, and I respect him a lot. Madam Chair, when we started this effort, you know, this is almost 20 years ago now, there was $1.4 million in another department 
called Administration for Native Americans, the Native American Language Act. 563 tribes plus Native Hawaii plus all of our U.S. territories in Micro-Asia were sharing in competitive grants um, to get that money, which, which um, where we're at today is phenomenal. And um, I want to just take time out and thank all of you for us getting there, you know, together because we've got a lot of good money in ANA now. We have money in the Department of Education for this, and then what you guys are doing, it's awesome. So I, um, you know, I wanted to put a context there, but with the Bureau of Schools, this is this is kind of my last example. My dad went to St. Stephen's Indian School on the Wind River Indian Reservation, and he was one of the many thousands of Indian kids that were spanked for talking Indian in school and on the playground and in their dorms. He was so excited before, he, he died four weeks ago, he was so excited that his alumni school is receiving one of these grants, yeah, I hear. And that's a real story. There's thousands others like it, but um, that was a real personal one with me. And I just real quick, I know I got 10 seconds, brother, if you wanna stand up and introduce yourself. And uh, uh, there, there. If you get yeah. close enough to a microphone so we can, uh, hear you and we're honored to have you with please you look into my eyes well thank you tell more but no one number quill but we will boy younger to the Mary above with all due respect thank you for the time and thank you brother for allowing me a little bit of time uh, we do co-chair the uh, native language task force at NTAI but it was an initiative that was started after we we've talked about languages for time every year every year every year but we never had any action items on how we're going to move this, this effort forward. And um, we saw that we're working within a bureaucratic system, being the United States government, and how grants and how funding and all of that is, is put into place. And so we cannot piecemeal this. And that's sort of what, what we're talking about. What he, uh, Ryan is talking about is that we're piecemealing everything that we want to do. And so you cannot sustain a function or an operation or a program if you don't have funding for multi-year because you cannot build the resources that you need to sustain that. And just like the example he gave, uh, you, can't, you don't build a store like that, you don't build a research facility like that, and uh, I like data and stuff. I'm an electrical engineer by profession, but I'm also fluent in my language and we, we support Esther Martinez uh, Bill, she was part of our community, and unfortunately, we lost her after she received the National Endowment uh, here in Washington, right. D.C., and she was going home, and she had an accident, and she was, she was gone, but consequently, the bill was named after her, but the efforts that we talk about is not just New Mexico, not just the Pueblos, but it's all across the Indian nation. All of the Indian nations are impacted by this, whether they are in a public school or a BIE controlled uh, school or a tribal controlled school. So education is education. And I think we all got to be on the same boat, the same platform, got to be fair for all of our children because that's how our future is going to be. We depend on our children and the knowledge that we set forth for them. and. Uh, including our culture, our language, and the dominant society's uh, language and approach as well. So thank you thank for you. the few moments. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you. Always good to hear from you, Mr. Garcia. Um, so I'm going to, I uh, passed a note to Janet. We'll, we'll uh, Mr. Joyce and I will we'll, we'll work with Darren too. We're going to see if we really need any authorization to go from, from one to five years, but then we have to look at the impact for how O and B scores things because then we're scoring for multiple years. Mm -hmm. And if and if that would mean that they want us to fund the five years up front, that could, anyways, we'll be in touch. And thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, we heard from the secondary schools about the cost of insurance. Is that something that um, you would um, agree that if, that for tribal schools to be on, on the, f I, I, I have to get a copy of the bill language in front of me that I just referenced uh, earlier to see if it's, you know, K through 12 or if it includes Head Start or what, what all it includes. Is insurance something that, um, that you're paying extra for that if you were in the federal plan you'd have more money? You mentioned it in your testimony. Uh, you would have more money to put back into student services? 
Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, it's definitely something we would be open to exploring. Right now, we're insured privately, like like any college with a, with a carrier or broker, and we actually self-insure. We moved to a self-insured health insurance model, but it's it's still a challenge with about 110 employees. That puts us right in the sweet spot for being too small to be what they call credible, but still large enough to be expensive. So okay. we would love to explore that option. So we'll we'll look into it. I don't know what if, the if, deal covers. If I'm Oh, I'm sorry. Could I answer it for the yeah. tribal colleges, just all the tribal colleges? Tribal colleges are eligible under the law, the, the new law, to um, participate as long as their tribe has a 638 contract. So oh. if, if their tribe has a 638 contract, they can participate. Any entity within the tribe can. So some of our tribal colleges have switched over and had tremendous savings. Um, but for the colleges, and I imagine IAIA does not have a 638 contract, so they're not eligible to participate in the federal employees program now. And they would uh, see cost savings. One college, I think their cost went down 30%. So it, it makes a huge difference. Anything that we can put back in the stu student services is, is well, right. well worth it. And it was, Ms. Harper, it was so great uh, being out there at um, Bugga Ganeshi School and, and seeing um, everything um, dual language mm -hmm. um, immersion. So it was friendly for me to find the cafeteria in the ladies' room, but um, the children also in that school knew that their language was, was important right. by looking at it, and that's, that's so, so impactful. So the work that you do um, in languages is very important. And to give a plug, I hear from my son who's a linguist all the time just how important they are. Mm -hmm. But one, one fact that hasn't been brought up that I want to put on the record is children who learn two languages excel in math. They excel in creativity. And they go off and on to learn other languages uh, because they crack the code of what it means to um, communicate. So thank you all for your work and what you do. And uh, with that, we are going to adjourn until 1 o'clock. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.